Okay. So, do you prefer Dr. Allward or... Peter's fine. Peter? Okay. Peter, it's very nice to meet you. Thank you for being here. Um, so, you are a PhD in philosophy. Yes. And you got your PhD at the University of North Carolina. In Chapel Hill. In Chapel Hill. Which is the main campus. Okay. Yeah. And um, you did most of your school in the U.S., I believe. That's correct? No, I did my undergraduate at the University of Toronto. Okay. And my master's at... Dalhousie and Halifax. All right. So you're going from... Just, just my doctorate down in the oh, okay. States. Okay. Oh, yes, sir. <laughs> Dalhousie in the U.S. and my head mixed up. Um, so how did you end up in at the University of Saskatchewan teaching philosophy here? Uh, how did I end up here? <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, it's, uh, I was teaching at the University of Lethbridge. My then-wife uh, was teaching here and okay. is still teaching here. Uh, and so, uh, and we have a kid, and so we were, I was going back and forth. Mm. Uh, and so when, uh, you know, I was trying to get a job at the University of Saskatchewan to avoid going back and forth under those yeah. circumstances. And when the, uh, the university had this, this very lucrative buyout to get rid of old faculty, and three of the seven members of the philosophy department took the buyout, which of course, one of the things with these buyouts is that they're... Uh, crude instruments for culling faculty mm. and uh, all of a sudden they found a department of seven which had been you know ten years earlier a department of nine cut down to four. Oh wow and that was the uh, that was my opportunity to say well I'll, I'll step in and yeah. uh, they were desperate enough they said okay we'll take you uh, so I uh, you know I, I was a uh, 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 hired into hired into the position, and in fact, they uh, at the same time said, "And you need to be department head." Uh, <laughs> it's a three right into the water, eh? Yes. Yeah. Huh. Sorry, and you said you had tea. You're okay. I with have that? some tea. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, it's interesting. What was that like? Just being thrown into it. Well, it was complicated because. At the same time, they were doing a reorganization of administration support, mm -hmm. and to replace the departmental secretary with a administrative commons, and so all the senior people who'd been department head before had retired. Mm -hmm. The departmental secretary is gone, and so uh, I'm just out there on my own. There was a there, there was a, a sessional lecturer with self interest who was always giving me advice, mm -hmm. uh, but beyond that, it was a. a uh, it was, you know, people would ask me to do things I didn't know how to do them. And my attitude was, well, if they don't ask me again, I'll just ignore it. And nothing <laughs> bad happened. Uh, and the things they really needed me to do, uh, the, they would ask again. Mm. Uh, bad lessons learned in my first year as department head. Uh, and I did discover what I like to jokingly refer to as the, the secret office down on the second floor where all the important things happen. Uh, mm. Myrna and Dorothy down there, and once I discovered them, I was able to get things done. Uh, but there was uh, there was very there was no mentorship. Uh, we just sort of cast out, you know, you know, <laughs> launched out on my own. Uh, it was a bit chaotic. Hmm. Uh, yeah, I, I would imagine. It, so the department going through this massive change right when you arrived was that a, like a result of something that had happened, or was everybody just kind of on their no, way? No, it out? was a, it was they had an incentivized retirement. They said, we'll give you, I think it was 200 grand if you retire. Oh, okay. Sorry, that was the buyout you mentioned. It was a buyout, oh, yes. Okay. So, and so there were, three, there were three people who were eligible. And so not everyone, who, you know, when they have these buyouts, not everyone who's eligible usually takes them. Mm. But it was one of the more lucrative offers, because they'll offer these periodically. But rarely are they as lucrative as that. And so... They wanted to get rid of some faculty. They offered a lot of money, and of course, it's a you know it's a blunt instrument, financial mm. incentives, uh, to uh, call the faculty. Yeah, and so they uh, I think they expected at least one, uh, and no more than two in philosophy to take it. But then a third person took it. So, mm. and is that just to kind of churn the department, or? Uh, it just, just people you know, at a certain age start thinking about retirement and trying to decide when they're going to go and all of a sudden there's an incentive maybe I'll go now yeah I mean I think it was uh, nothing more than that mm. uh, uh, I mean there's there's been a number of generations in the department you know you know you have people sort of hired around the same time we're approaching another cluster of people who are going to start 
we were hired around 2000, uh, uh, one of whom is going to retire, so there's going to be another crisis coming up soon. But I'm not department head anymore, so it's not my problem. <laughs> yeah, you gotta, you can leave it to somebody else now. Exactly, oh. if, if someone else volunteers to do it. Yes. And so how, how long were you department head for? I was eight of the last nine years. I did a five-year term, got an administrative leave, and then I did a, another three-year term, which mm. is the first term is standardly five years. The second terms are standardly three years. Okay. Uh, so and uh, so I did eight of the last nine years. I, I stepped down uh, in June of 2023. Mm. And now you're on your I got continuing a, because your leave. It's after a five year, you get a full year admin leave. After a three year, you get a half year. Oh, okay. And you, you can't get your sabbatical. You, you can't double dip. It's, you, know, you, <laughs> yeah. you use the time towards an admin leave or uh, a sabbatical. You can't sort of say, oh, I'm going to use that same time for both of them. Mm. So you can game the system, but only you, to a little bit. You can't. It, there's not a whole lot of gaming. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, and so it's nice to step away and do start doing other things. But uh, in a small department, there's always the, uh, the question, will somebody else step up and do it? And we had an interim this past year, and it looks like uh, no one's going to step up again for next year. Hmm. But I'm on leave, so I'm not going to go to Yeah, leaves. they can't ask you any questions, right? Exactly. Yeah. And so when you're department head, are you um, just administrating the department, or are you teaching and doing research as well at the same time? Yeah, well, I mean, it's... Uh, what they do is they uh, give you um, they give you a teaching reduction, and it's all that depends on the department what the standard is. Mm. Uh, and so we normally in philosophy have we teach four courses a year, or I like to say four point five a year. Uh, there's usually a, uh, every at least every second year you've got to do a piggybacked graduate un undergraduate course every second year. So one year you'll do four, the next year you do five. Uh, including the graduate course. Okay. Uh, and the department head uh, drops down by two by two of those. So it's, you know, two one year, two plus a grad the next year. Mm. And, uh, sorry, go continue. Ahead. I was just going to ask you how much you enjoyed that part of it as well, or if you were more interested in the kind of like the department head oh, stuff. Oh, the, 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 the department head uh, is, it in some way is rewarding, but as I like to joke, uh, the 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 role is department sewer mange su sewer <laughs> sewer main okay all, all shit flows through me yeah <laughs> so I mean you you know you got a par a parental complaint which you get uh, comes to the department head you know somebody you know there's been you know you know complaints about faculty someone gets sick it's my you know you know and, and can't complete teach the course it's my job to fix it so whenever crises come up. Uh, uh, it's your job to deal with it, and yeah. and you know the main thing you have to advocate for is positions. I mean that's the the main uh, you know you know the main thing that you need the resources to hire people, hmm. and you know with uh, shrinking budgets and administrators trying to put their mark on things, you you find yourself faced with different uh, you know different impediments to trying to, to trying to do what you're supposed to be doing mm. uh, and uh, uh, and so the uh, you know the department head is supposed to say look here's the departmental interest and you're supposed to be that voice at the table uh, and uh, <clears throat> it's a series of constant little distractions which is why it's good to, uh, you know why it's good to have the, the reduced teaching load uh, but even so it's hard to get much writing done just because you know, for writing, you need a block of time, mm. uh, you know, to just get anything done. And you rarely get those blocks of time when your department head. It's hard to spend half an hour uh, working on a, a paper when, you know, it takes you an hour and a half to remind yourself what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. You, yeah. You definitely need to set aside that time to yeah. force yourself into it. And so I, I did say research, but when we were chatting beforehand, you said it's, it's not called research. It's called... Um... R-S-A-W. Research, scholarly, and artistic work. Okay. And so uh, when you say writing, that's what you're referring to? That's what my, you know, uh, publishing books and articles in philosophy. Whether that counts as research, scholarly, or artistic work, I leave that for others to decide. Okay. Fair enough. <laughs> uh, I mean, it, it doesn't neatly fit into any of the categories. Scholarly work is probably the closest, mm. but... Uh, it's sort of it's more 
problem solving in some ways. Yeah. Is that kind of scholarly work? I don't know. I was. Just, I mean, I well, don't scholarly, know. Scholarly work has that flavor of you know you're doing scholarship, you're doing deep diving into other, you know, into you know old texts. Yeah. And you do that. You do some of that, but that's sort of not the you know it's more more on the analysis side. Mm. Okay. And so when you were teaching, is that is that what you were teaching? How to do that, or was that oh, just no. more? Oh uh, no, I, I uh, we don't have a methods course. Oh uh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Uh, 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 people learn how to do philosophy by doing philosophy, Fair uh, enough, and the, yeah. the student, you know. But uh, no, I I typically teach uh, uh, as my introductory course. I teach uh, critical thinking, which is uh, which is a lot of fun. Uh, although the classes are quite big, so they're about one hundred and fifty. Uh, but uh, uh, and uh, so I've been teaching critical thinking and one other course a year. Uh, and so it's, if it's a grad course, I, you know, you know, I'll have a, an advanced undergrad course that's piggybacked with a grad course. So you have both groups of students in the same class and, uh, that stuff is usually on something, you know, related to my research, okay. my, my RSAW. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, uh, I've uh, been teaching. I mean, I've been working on the philosophy of fiction, so I've been teaching courses on fiction. Mm. Uh, my uh, next, I have a plan for next year. It's going to be uh, uh, works, words, no words, works, and characters. Okay. So on the metaphysics of, of words, the metaphysics of musical works, and the metaphysics of fictional characters. Wow. Okay. I want to get into that because I was I was looking at your I was kind of looking through your your work last night and I was getting really excited looking at all of it because I've I've been into philosophy for a long time like I said when mm -hmm. I emailed you but um never systematically I didn't I only took one philosophy class in school so but anyway so what is like, what is metaphysics exactly what does that term mean uh, well metaphysics concerns the nature of reality in some, okay. in, a, in a in a broad sense. Uh, what sort of things exist? What you know, you know, in sort of in, in, you know, abstract sense, and what what are they like? Mm. Yeah. Uh, so you know, those are the sorts of questions. But there's a lot more. I mean, uh, you, people often contrast it with the uh, with epistemology. You know, epistemology. How do I know about it? And then what's the thing I'm knowing about it like? Is a way of the, viewing metaphysics. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. So, so uh, uh, the kind of questions that I work on. Well, you know, fictional characters. Uh, do they exist? Do they not exist? Uh, and if they existed, what what sorts of things would they be? Mm. I mean, that, those are the, you know, and, you know, how can we refer to, uh, think about them? Yeah. And so, how, I guess, how do you go about? How do you how do you start looking into that? Because like, clearly, well, you, they you start by reading what other people have written. Oh, fair enough. I mean, so, I mean, you know, it's a it's a a discipline where the first thing you do is you. I mean, some people like to work in a vacuum, and that usually results in bad outcomes because because you've had thousands of years of people working on stuff. Why are you starting from scratch? Mm -hmm. So uh, you you typically start out by you know, you know you know by reading you know what people have written, and then uh, you know. Uh, you know, I often find I have an idea going in, uh, but what I think about it, but it evolves as you read. And then you sort of, you know, you know, you know, part of what I like to do is work on the, uh, the expository side first, trying to articulate uh, what's, what are the questions people are asking, what are the views that have been defended. Uh, and then, you know, the, then you do the, the critical piece where you say, aha, here are the views that have been defended, here, here's what I think is wrong with these approaches, these answers to the questions, uh, you know, and then you do the positive piece saying, and here's what I think a right answer looks like. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, you know, I mean, reading, but, you know, not just reading, but, you know, you know, it, talking to people, you know, I mean, you know, you know, one of the reasons that conferences are, are nice is that you can go and see a bunch of talks and things that you hadn't, you know, done any reading on and say, aha, I'd be interested in looking at this. Uh, uh, which I've done from time to time, uh, and uh, but but reading, talking to people, so you know, conversation is you know you know is one of the ways in which you know, philosophy occurs. So when you get you know, it's not one of the parts of the process is 
presenting papers and having conversations uh, with the audience about papers he presented uh, to them. Mm-hmm. And so what, like, when you present a paper, is it the same way um, a paper would be presented in like chemistry, for example? Is it just presented to a journal? And you, um, no, no, I, I mean a public presentation. Oh, my apologies. Okay. Yeah, so a public presentation. So, you, you know, so... Uh, you, know, you go into a room full of people and you tell them what you, you, you tell them what's going on in your paper. Mm. Uh, I, I no longer read papers. I, I actually you know, work from notes and you know though there's there's almost always a paper that exists that I convert into notes and then t- and then talk through it. Mm. That seems like that would be a hard issue with uh, in terms of working from a vacuum, like you said, some people do too. Like one, why would you try and start this from scratch? But it's likely that you're gonna come up with something that there's already a paper on too right, right. well there is that i mean I, uh, I i won't mention him there's one person in particular i know who <laughs> thinks that everyone else is an idiot so doesn't read anybody else mm-hmm. uh, but as a result his stuff is unpublishable because the first thing referees at journals ask is well you know how are you responding to this person's view and if your attitude well i'm not going to read that person because they're an idiot uh well then you're not going to get your paper published. yeah one so, what if you're saying I, I, yeah as i i I know at least one person who proceeds in that way. Okay. Uh, but I, as I say, I won't mention it. Yeah, no, of course. Uh, and I won't ask. I, I, I avoid <laughs> slander. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. You say at least one person. Is that a relatively um, frequent issue in philosophy? or No, not these days. I mean, g- given the, the emphasis on, on publishing, uh, because, you know, the, uh, you know, in order to these days, in the old, in the olden days, you didn't need to publish until you got hired into a into a position. Okay. Uh, these days, you, you you know, to even be considered for a position, you need to have publications already mm-hmm. when you're a grad student. Uh, so uh, uh, there's a lot more people, a lot more you know, people adopting professional publishing standards before they even start in the job. Yeah, it's uh, become more of a requirement. It's yeah. it's become you know, you know and and you know once you get the job, uh, in order to uh, to get tenure, uh, you have to meet publishing thresholds of various kinds. Mm. Okay. So I mean, uh, yeah. and so uh, you you can't be messing around uh, doing you know working in your own personal vacuum because you know, you'll never get you'll never get uh, you know published and that means you'll never you won't get tenure. So. Mm. Well, it makes enough sense too, right? Like the, the most universities, you'd hope, are places that are trying to push themselves onto the forefront of knowledge, and so to do that, you need to be publishing works and working right. within the field and knowing what other people are doing too. Right, you're right. I mean, yeah. I mean, I, sorry, I was I was about to say something fairly cynical about universities. <laughs> no, go ahead. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I mean, what administrators at universities want is <laughs> accolades yeah fair enough uh, yeah and you know, and they want accolades based on measurements that you know that people you know they you know, especially people in government care about and so what they you know they primarily are concerned with is research grants and that's how they meant mm-hmm. that you know and big splashy things like the synchrotron you know yeah yeah so they you know you know things that make the university look good mm-hmm. uh uh, you got all this money, you won these grants, uh, but you know, uh, beyond that, do they care about the development of knowledge? Some administrators do. Uh, I, I, I'll put it that way. I, I, I have to try to be less general in my cynicism. Uh, but uh, yeah, so that so, so that this is of course uh, you know the, the first of many tangents. I, 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 I'm notorious for my tangents. What were we talking about again? Yeah, no, I, I got to think about it too. No, that makes well on the, just on that that makes that makes sense too, right? Like it's just not that it's necessarily the way it should be, but I, yeah, I can completely see why why it would end up like that. But um, no, I was just um um I actually can't remember where we were going, but um. So you said something though that um, uh, I was thinking about. So when you say like the university wants to show off that they've won grants, are, the grants are not coming to the professors and researchers from the university, or um, no, the uh, they want 
primarily tri council funding. Oh, I've never heard of this. Oh, it's 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 federal government funding. Oh, uh, and it's uh, you know, and it's these are competitions across the across the country. Uh, you know, people in the humanities and social sciences, it's sure the social sciences and humanities research council grants. Those are the ones, but there's NSERC grants for the scientists, uh, and uh, and. You know, they they consider the measure of how well the university's doing to be uh, you know determined in large part by the the dollar value of the grants that are received from these organizations in particular, because those uh, and it's more complicated. I mean, one can be completely cynical, but on the other hand, uh, the provincial government base its distribution of funds to the University of Saskatchewan and the University of Regina, you know, how, do, how does that, who gets what, on, in part, on how much research grants money both places get. Mm. So it, it's not just an internal thing, it's also an internal thing that reflects these external uh, pressures. Yeah, I didn't know that. I thought all the grant money was coming from within, but that makes sense. No, I mean there there is some internal grant money, but I mean it's a, the, the the kind of grants that make the university look good are are grants that come from without because uh, that means you've been competing with you know, other people across the country and doing well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can't just say look at all the money I'm giving myself. I'm doing right, so exactly. Yeah. Yes. No. Okay. Uh, and, but it, but the funny thing is, and this this is the funny thing is, is that. Getting this money costs the university money, and so because the, 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 you know the, the, the university often has to match the money. Uh, they you know, there are costs. You know somebody you know, wins an answer grab for setting a grant for setting a lab. Well, the university has to pay the the fees for maintaining the space, and, right? And so uh, and there you know there are other costs you know that the university incurs. When someone gets a grant, so the the you know the incentives are, yeah, yes, we want grants, uh, but thinking in terms of whether or not this really makes the university better off financially is an entirely different question, mm -hmm. uh, and they and they want us to get grants, uh, even though we don't need grants. Yeah. So I've had these conversations where they said, "Well, you guys need to get more grants." I said, well, "What do I need grants for?" And they they look at you it's like. And then revealing, of course, they have no idea what you do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I and then I go into my story about the University of Pittsburgh, uh, and they just look confused because it's not the, the the paradigm through which they're seeing these things. Yeah, they've got this this more business oriented it's get the, grant money. And... My 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 joke my joke is I I have all these jokes. Uh, yes, you're counting beans. But we're running a corn farm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Well, like you said, it's just, you guys don't. You cost much, much less because you're not doing experiments per se. Yeah, we. You know, all we need is an office and a computer, mm -hmm. and you know, a, and a library. Uh, <clears throat> but beyond that, we're good. Yeah. So you you brought up Pittsburgh again. You're telling me a little bit that, about that before before we started. Oh, sorry, so, I forgot we didn't have that. <laughs> no, I was just, I, I was just waiting to, for a good time to bring it back up. But yeah, like, so you you said that Pittsburgh kind of moved themselves around in such a way that they were able to become the best school in f philosophy. Well, they're they're one of the best philosophy schools in the world, and okay. the the story. And of course, you know, you know, who knows? I mean, this is from the '60s. Right. But the story is that. You know, because it's 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 random. You know, it never occurred to you that Pittsburgh is the best university at anything. Well, I'd never heard that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you you might not even have heard of the University of Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and uh, the story is is that back in the '60s, the administration decided they wanted to be the best at something, and they went around having discussions about what that something would be. You can't be the best at chemistry because chemistry requires big fancy machines. That's too expensive. You can't be the best at history because they don't need big fancy machines, but they have big departments. And so they, they uh, the story goes, they decided, well, philosophy, no fancy machines, small departments. They don't need anything beyond offices, office spaces and, uh, and computers. And so they decided to become the best at philosophy and they succeeded not the best but i mean they're you know they're considered to be one of the top you know five or six well, 
uh, going maybe to maybe top 10 in the world in philosophy. Mm. Uh, and uh, they, they, and they, it was largely a matter of hiring a bunch of top-notch faculty and they're creating a self-sustaining culture. Mm. And so I guess what is that what does that look like? I don't I don't know much about the academia of philosophy. How do you distinguish yourself as from from the other schools? Well, I mean, uh, there are you know, there, of course, there's a controversy in uh, in in philosophy over rankings of philosophy departments. Okay, uh, but uh, yeah, no, I mean, there there there's uh, Brian Leiter, who is a bit of a lightning rod, developed a, a ranking based on faculty reputation. So the, mm. the the reputation of faculty of as researchers. And did surveys to find out, you know, you know, here's the list of faculties, uh, the, the, the uh, faculty at the, uh, you know, you know, at various universities based on these people. What do you think the strongest department is? And that, that was, you know, that now a lot of people think that's not the best measure. Uh, there are other measures, and it's not, you know, but uh, uh, whatever the measure, uh, Pittsburgh is considered to be, uh, you know, one of the best places, at least in terms of faculty, but also in terms of the success of graduate students and the programs there. And the like, and the, the kind of philosophical culture they've cre- they've created. Yeah. But I mean, in terms of in terms of measures, uh, you know, the, you know, the whole you know the whole idea of measuring you know uh, you know or ranking uh, departments, some people find to be mm-hmm. uh, some people find to be you know, anathema, you know, a terrible idea. Yeah, it's interesting to go by reputation, right? Because that's that's a weird one. Because it can be it can be it can be artificially inflated quite a bit sometimes in some cases well i mean yeah i mean so and that's why you don't have you, you don't base it on you know one person's assessment of reputation right this broader i mean uh, lighter brian lighter he's at chicago the university of chicago philosophy and law school uh i mean his his attitude and he was originally it was a service to the profession it became look what you normally did is you'd ask one person, you know, where should I go to grad school? And you'd ask like one person or two people in your department, and they had their biases. Mm. Is that, you know, here are, the, here are the places where the good people are, and and this was just meant to be. Well, let's not focus on what one or two people think. Let's focus on what a broader range of people think. Yeah. And it it ended up, you know, in its early days, providing uh, good information. You know, it gave you some ideas of. You know the kinds of places where you know they had good reputations, so it gave you the opportunity if you finished your dissertation, of you know getting a job because you went to a place with a good reputation. I mean that 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 being the, uh, you know you know, the goal for many for, for many grad students is to yeah. get into a good place and then once you finish, get a job. And so uh, Brian Leiter's you know the, the what he calls it, the philosophical gourmet report. Okay. Uh, uh, but lighter is apparently apparently he's a nice person in person, mm. but he's kind of an online dick, okay. uh, and so he pisses people off anyhow. And then you know people who criticized his ranking, he would you know go off on them you know in public, and uh, and he's got the thinnest skin of any philosopher, I think, at least online. Uh, so he's very prickly about stuff, yeah. uh, and so there were you know controversies. Uh, in um, in the philosophy blogosphere, <laughs> yeah, yeah, is that is that typically an attack on the person, or is that more his work? That's, that's... no, it's a, it's 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 an you know it's an attack on him personally. Yeah. That, but they they don't. A lot of people very much like his what he does in terms of the uh, this gourmet report. A lot of people hate it. That's mm. you know people. He's kind of a lightning rod in the profession. You yeah. you love him or you hate him. Uh, uh, but uh, yeah, but I mean. <clears throat> Uh, you know, how do you measure the quality of the department? I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> it, this is one way that's at least clear what you're doing. Whether or not it's the only way is a separate question. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, no, this is a good point because a lot of the times it's better than um, just having something in place so that those ideas start getting rolling is better than nothing, right? Like we've set up at least there is a system yeah. that has a metric for that. Yeah, yeah. and 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 the, the thing about you know that was that that's what. People who critiqued lighter, you know, they said, "Don't use lighter." Well, how are we supposed to decide? And 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 people said, "Well, just talk to somebody." But I mean, lighter is taking care of that. You're talking to more people. Mm. Uh, but you know, as I say, that was you know, there's been a period of 
we seem to be entering a you know if, if uh, I sort of follow the philosophy blogosphere, there used to be like a half dozen philosophy blogs where there was all sorts of controversy going on. It seems to have settled down. Yeah, okay. There's, there's just two philosophy blogs, uh, well, main ones still standing. There's there's other ones out there. Yeah. But, uh, uh, Brian Leiter's, uh, Leiter, I think it's called Leiter Reports, and then uh, Daily, what's it called? The Daily News, N O U S. Wow. Okay. Uh, put up by Justin Weinberg, who I don't remember where he is. Maybe South Carolina. Okay. And so I know this is not the same as a, a blog, but um, it kind of brought this back up in my mind as well. You're talking about giving um public present presentations about um mm -hmm. uh, papers or works or, or notes, mm -hmm. and so when you give those presentations, um, is it a forum like is there a conversation going on afterwards or are you just like presenting this oh no it, 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 it's the back the, the, the conversation is the best part okay yeah uh, so so typically uh it's you know slightly more than half the time presenting and then the rest of the time taking questions okay uh, and there's a lot of back and forth yeah i'd imagine that gets pretty exciting well <laughs> some people might say it depends what you mean by exciting but uh uh no it can be i mean the culture in philosophy has changed. Philosophy used to be very, you know, in the question period, it used to be very aggressive, very much aimed at proving the person was wrong. Mm. Trying to find, you know, trying to find decisive objections. Aha, you're wrong. Uh, uh, it's, that culture has changed to a certain extent. Uh, it tends to be, I mean, you still get that, but it's, uh, it, it, there's often more clarifications, suggestions, more back and forth than there used to be. Mm. Uh, 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 but, uh, as you know, but it, it can be productive. It, 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 it depends on the audience. I mean, you, you can have a good audience, you can have a bad audience. Uh, you know, we have a, we have a regular well, here we have a regular colloquium series at the the philosophy department here. So, uh, once a month, uh, and you know, you get faculty from you know. Well, there's there's two departments at, at the University of Saskatchewan. The St. Thomas More has its own philosophy department. Okay. So the two philosophy departments, and then you get some grad students, and the occasional undergraduate, and the occasional odd other person will show up. So if you have twenty people for the colloquium, you're, you're feeling like you've done pretty well. Mm. But, we, uh, but we also have the Philosophy in the Community series, which is once, once a month at the, uh, in the basement of the Anglican Church next to the refinery. I don't know where that is. Oh, the refinery is up on, uh, it's up near Broadway. Uh, the refin refiners is a, perform a performance space. Okay, I do. I think I know. I do think I know the area. It's, it's sort of yeah. in, in behind, you know, one block behind Victoria School. Okay. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, and there's an Anglican church next to it. Okay. So there's two buildings: the refinery and then this Anglican church. Uh, I can't remember which particular saint it is. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And then down in the basement is where we we host it, and we we can get fifty to seventy people out. Wow. Uh, and the and uh, largely community members. Uh, you know, some uh, some ex students, uh, some you know retired people, uh, and who are just interested in coming out, and uh, uh, you know you can get as I say, uh, it gets a good crowd, and uh, uh, they, they you know it's a much different question period because of course they have uh, you know you know they're not used to what you're doing, so you have to sort of you, you would you don't give a professional level talk. Mm. You try and make it more accessible, uh, and the questions tend to be all over the map. I I gave I I, I gave a, a talk on the the philosophy of humor in this part of the series a few years ago, and this very angry comedian showed up, professional comedian who, who was who was certain that I was saying things that I wasn't saying that he found offensive to the profession of oh, comedians. <laughs> That's funny. It was. It, and yet it wasn't. Uh, yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the angry <laughs> comedian was not being particularly funny at the time. Uh, but I, I you know, and I recently did one on, uh, you know, musical, you know, the a musical ontology, mm -hmm. the nature, you know, the nature nature of musical works, which went quite well, uh, just in the uh, 
I think it was this past fall. Okay. And th- so does that happen pretty often with this comedian where he said, like, it seems like you're saying he wasn't really picking up what you were saying and then misconstruing. Well, I mean, in the philosophy of the community, I mean, people have a lot of different backgrounds. Yeah. And, <laughs> you know, we're professional philosophers. I mean, look, everybody does philosophy all the time. Mm. I mean, you know, philosophy is just thinking and talking about stuff. Uh uh, you know, but professional philosophers, you know, academic philosophers, you know, we do it for a living. We've got, you know, our, you know, our, you know, our argument, you know, we, we know all this background material. Uh, we, we, you know, we, we, under, we frame the problem space in certain ways. We understand what counter good and bad reasons. You know, we understand the implications of views and people who don't have the same background, uh, you know, though they do philosophy, they, you know, they're, they're not, you know, they're, you know, they're not. I, I, I hesitate to say as good at it, or but I mean, you know, they, you know, they're, they don't, they often miss some of the nuances of what's going on. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. And you know, uh, you know, and and they, and they often sort of free associate. You know, it's like, oh, you say you you say this word. Here's how I understand this word. Let me ask you about this meaning of the word. Yeah. And you try and tie it back into you know you, you I mean, you know. Your responses to a public audience are different from your responses to an academic audience. Mm-hmm. Uh, with an academic audience, if you meet someone who's being combative, you're combative back. Yeah. Uh, with a, with a, with a you know uh, the public, you know, you meet someone who's being combative, you try not to be, you know, you you, you try and say, oh, hold it, you know, without being condescending, saying, no, mm-hmm. hold it, here's what I'm doing, I'm not doing that. Here's, you know, so you you, you try and more explain than put your boxing gloves on your <laughs> yeah well uh, there's some people like a lot, a lot of the time it's just that <laughs> i imagine this happens in in philosophy a lot is you, somebody will say something and this seems like what you're getting at and you're just kind of like okay i can't i need you to bring you i need to bring you up to speed on this topic yeah, and, so that and, we can and, go and, forward and you have to do it without being condescending yeah you can't make them feel like an idiot right right yeah it's a tough one because even like I've read there's been mm-hmm. philosophy texts that I've read and you're talking about the nuance where I'm going through it and I'm reading it and not understanding but it's, it's difficult to look at that and I think I do a good job at reading a text and going okay I don't understand this but that doesn't mean that whatever this person is saying is wrong is that I'm missing something that I'm right. not able to pick up on it doesn't mean that they're right <laughs> yeah right yeah but um but yeah it just I guess yeah it doesn't just because you're not understanding something doesn't necessarily mean that it's incoherent no, it no. could, but yeah, it's not necessarily. Yeah. I mean, you know, you know, one thing that I'm asked to do is referee papers, you know, peer review of papers from time to time. Mm. And my attitude is if after three or four readings, I can't understand it, that whether or not it's incoherent, it can't be published until it's been made clear. Yeah, yeah. And I say, you know, you know and, and I've said that, I, just, I simply can't understand what this person is saying. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, you know, I can't recommend publication because I don't know what they're saying. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, uh, but yeah, so I mean, you know, and different works of philosophy are designed for different audiences. And some, you know, especially in the journals, they're, they're designed for audiences that are familiar with the background literature from the other from other articles and so that sort of presupposed that you're familiar with that already uh, when you're reading it it's you know it's written for people who've done that you know all six of them uh, and uh, um, and so you know one of the one of the things uh, that uh, referees are called on to do is to say look you know we picked you because you're one of those six people it's usually bigger than six uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and so you know whether this is comprehensible to somebody with the with the relevant background, mm. yeah. You know, but uh, but yeah. So I mean, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, well, I'll, I'll tell you a loosely related anecdote. Sure. <laughs> uh, so uh, when I was at North University of North Carolina, one one of the good things about being at a big research school like that is that famous people came through, and so. Noam Chomsky came and gave a, lyric, a wow, series of talks. Cool. Actually, that's the name I know. Yeah. yeah, and of course, Noam Chomsky does two different things. He does political stuff, and he does you know so you know a very very anti-capitalist political stuff. But he also does uh, stuff in work in lingu- linguistics, and he gave these two talks 
one political talk, one linguistics talk. And uh, I, I still remember where uh, I went to the linguistics talk and this person who had missed the, uh, missed the uh, uh, political talk, but that's what he was interested in, uh, started asking questions at the linguistic talk as if the linguistics talk was the political talk. Oh, and, boy. And I think Chomsky has had enough dumb questions over the year that he's, <laughs> yeah, uh, that he's over is, it. That he is not patient with those sorts of responses. Mm. You know, it was very quick dismissive. It's got, today's talk has nothing to do with that. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, uh, yeah, so I mean, part of the issue is different works are designed for different audiences. And you, one thing you have to figure out if you don't understand what's going on, is this book written for me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, and uh, you know, a lot of academic books are aimed at other academics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've definitely been there. There's, uh, yeah, I've picked up a book before and got through it, and I'm like, this is not, this wasn't written for me as a layman here. So, mm -hmm. and it's you gotta sometimes, and that's okay, you know, right? You, you just gotta put it down or or get up to speed if you want to read right. that topic. Yeah. So, do you um, do you section off your work at all in into those two different spheres, like for more for the public, more for academia? No, I, I I write, I write. For academic audiences, uh, I do pride myself on being an extremely clear writer, but when I'm giving a public talk, I'll start with the uh, uh, the uh, the academic paper and then sort of say, okay, how can I make this comprehensible to other people? Right. So, so I, you know, I write, you know, I you know, I only write in one way. I don't write, I don't write public philosophy pieces. Mm but I do give occasionally public philosophy talks as, as part of the, uh, the, you know, the philosophy in the community series. Right. Okay. Uh, and but again, go ahead. Sorry. No, I was just going to ask you to elaborate on, on clear a little bit. You said you, you pride yourself as being a, a clear writer. What do you mean by that? I, I try and make things as comprehensible as possible to the, to the readers. I mean, mm. you know, and, uh, and one of the uh, comments I've, I've, I've regularly gotten, uh, uh, from referees, even when they've re even when they've rejected my papers, uh, you know, you know, is unusual clarity. Uh, oh, that's flattering. Uh, yeah. well, it is flattering because uh, that's one that I, I, you know, that I pride myself on is mm. trying is is trying to make it as clear as possible. Mm. And I, I think I'm uh, I think I'm good at that. Uh, now, of course, if you're clear, then if you're wrong, you're clearly wrong. Yes. Yeah. Well, that that's interesting that you said that because that was my next my next question is, and I don't mean in any way to suggest anything about. Um, um, the discipline of philosophy as a whole, but is there a, is there people that write unclearly and try to convolute their arguments so that it's harder to argue with because you kind of people they expect that expect that people are going to look at it and go I don't know if I can make an argument against this because it's too complicated. Well, I mean, the, the answer is almost certainly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but it, it's it's a tricky strategy because uh, of the peer review system. Right. So, so you know, typically, if you submit an article to a journal, you're going to have a couple of peer reviewers who are going to say, "Look, uh, I can't figure out what's going on here. This needs to be a lot clearer, and we're not going to publish it unless you make it clear." Mm. I mean, that now every now and again, uh, you know, you know, the peer review process is not a perfect process. It depends on you know who you can get as referees, and people are overworked and are getting lots of you know lots of requests. For refereeing, uh, and you know, sometimes it's hard to get somebody to referee, and so sometimes you end up going to a graduate student rather than, you know, you know, I, I refereed the odd paper as a grad student, which probably wasn't a good idea, <laughs> you know. But I mean, you know, journals are, you know, you know, hard pressed to find people willing to do it. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's the reality yeah. of it. I, I, I get, I usually get asked four or five times a year. Well, there's uh, a lot of work. Uh, the way I do it is, I, I mean, I, I, I make a point, I, I have a process, I, I, I have to read it, you know, once a day for three or four days until I feel I've got a, a handle on what's going on in the article. Mm. Uh, and then I'll, I'll work on a report the next day, which, you know, after I've gone through that process, uh, I can do in three or four hours, usually, mm. maybe less. Wow. Uh, but, Sorry, continue. No, I, this is my bad. I keep interrupting you. It's okay. No, no, but I, but I mean, you know, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's 
a disciplinary duty to do this. Mm. You know, and so I almost always do it when I'm asked. You know, there's a couple. You know, if it's not if something that's too far out of my area of expertise, mm. I'll say no. Uh, uh, and uh, there's at least one journal who I felt poorly treated by, uh, and so I, you know, uh, in terms of their handling of a paper I submitted to them to, to you know, you know, f waited three, three or four years and never ever got a decision and they stopped responding to me. Wow, is that a long time? That seems like a... That's, that's a long time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and so I, 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 they're on my do not submit list, do not referee list. Yeah. Um, uh, but... Uh, uh, wow. But the, uh, no, I... Uh, the standards, and this of course made the refereeing pinching me tighter, people were complaining about this and so they these days you get a you know, when they ask you to be a referee they say and we want a six-week turnaround <laughs> and and uh not everyone's in a position to say in the next six week i'll be able to spend that chunk of time mm -hmm. uh, so it makes it even harder to get referees that's yeah it seems tight especially if you want to give like people are like you're professionals right so you've got all your other responsibilities but if you want to create a comprehensive analysis of something too especially if it's quite an extensive paper i'd imagine like you don't it's not something you want to just like glance at like you said you look at it for multiple days before you even start the actual well, exactly um, yeah, and and not everyone does that yeah uh, some you know some you know some people are better at you know at you know than i am at sort of figuring out the paper on the first read but i i you know, i i feel and and some people basically do a half-ass job that happens sometimes as well uh and of course you know editors you know they're not going to read all the papers themselves they rely on the judgments of referees and uh, these days if one of the referees is negative even if the other referee is really positive that's a, that's a reject Just, wow. uh, so you basically you, you have to have both referees give you at least uh uh a thumbs nearly up, uh, you know, because the standard, it's very rare that a, a submitted article is accepted as is. Uh, you know, uh, you know, but, you know, the sort of the standard way to get published is through what's called the revise and resubmit. It says we're rejecting it, but we think it's promising. So if you send in a revised version that makes these revisions, we'll reconsider. And that's sort of the you know so that that's the standard way. Yeah, I mean, every, you know, once or, once or twice I've gotten the slightly better route, which is the conditional acceptance. We're accepting it on condition that you make a few more minor changes. Mm. Uh, but yeah, so I mean, it's a you know you have to have at least you know you know the the two referees say, look, uh, we think this can turn into a publishable, a publishable piece after one round of revisions. Okay. Yeah, two rounds of you know is, is well that's not ready. That that you know that's a reject. Mm. So I've 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 often said, look, there's some ideas here, but I don't think this paper will be publishable in one round of revisions. So, uh, you know, I encourage the the author to work on the paper, but it's a it's a no from this journal. Yeah, it's, it needs a little bit more work before it can come back. Be before before it can even get a revise and resubmit. Yeah, and so. Um, obviously you alluded to the fact that there's, there's a numbers issue that it's hard to get as many referees as would be like, but is it, is it having to a downside to that? Cause then you can kind of get a point where you can't have, um, a majority in either uh, direction. Two is standard. Some, some places have three. Hmm. I mean, and editors have different, editors have different procedures for moving from referee reports to decisions because all referees do is make a recommendation to the editors okay and then the editors make the decision mm -hmm. oh, okay I see but, but the editors typically haven't read the article themselves because they, they've got too many to handle so uh, but you know exactly what their process is from going from you know referee reports to decision is you know it varies with the journal mm -hmm. And the more prominent journals, you know, typically there's one bad report, it's a reject. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, some are some even saying, look, we don't even like revise and resubmits that much. Hmm. Uh, just because 
Uh, we've only got so many pages. We've got so many submissions. Uh, we know that even, you know anyone that gets the revise and resubmit isn't going to pass muster at the end of the day. Oh, okay. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> yeah, so, uh, so you know, some of, some of the journals don't even want don't really want revise and resubmit. Mm. I mean, uh, you know, many of us who are gentler touches try and see if the paper can be a revise and resubmit. I mean, it's you know. You know, because you want to be more, you want to be more positive, uh, if you can. Uh, you know, uh, a lot of, ref especially in my younger days, a lot of ref reports were 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 cruel. Uh, <laughs> this is this is garbage. <laughs> yeah. Go into another field. Yeah. Uh, uh, but uh, you know, so you, you you do try to be positive. But I mean, you know, again, it's all you know. You get a lot of requests. I mean, I don't get, you know, I get a fair number of requests, but I mean, there are people who get way more requests than I do mm. uh, because, you know, the, the more prominent people in the field, you know, they, you know, you know they get a lot, they get a lot of requests. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, and then some people who are less prominent don't get any requests at all. I mean, you know, it's, uh, and so a lot of the time when editors say they can't find referees is because they're looking at too small of a pool of referees. But I mean, how do you how do you expand the pool? I mean, you have to start doing you have to you have to start researching individual departments. Aha, who works in this area? Yeah. Uh, but and typically, you know, you some you, you get on their radar if you submit a uh, uh, a paper to the journal. Once you make you know that you, I, I very often see that I submit a paper to a new journal, uh, they reject or they accept or reject it, uh, and then I get a request from that journal to referee. Yeah, just so, start working. You're on our it. radar yeah. now. Uh, yeah, and it's uh, you know and it's free work. Uh, they don't get you don't get paid for it. Oh, okay, well, I <laughs> I posted this on uh, on Facebook yesterday. It was it was hilarious. Uh, uh, Oxford University Press. Uh, you know they. Uh, 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 they, uh, I just did some refereeing for one of their journals, the British Journal of, of Aesthetics, and they decided that they they were going to reward me with a reviewer certificate. Oh my goodness! <laughs> so this electronic reviewer, so I said, "Congratulations for having reviewed for the British Journal of Aesthetics in 2023." Yeah, that's funny, but no, you don't get any money. <laughs> uh, you don't get any money, and 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 uh, you know, well, the, the journal system, especially with the, so the big publishers like Wiley and. Uh, and uh, Springer, uh, the authors don't get any money. Oh wow! The yeah. referees don't get any money. Uh, all the money goes to the journal. <laughs> right. And in particular, in particular, and, and what happens is you have a journal that's kind of independent, but they can't sustain it on their own, and then they got bought up by Springer in particular. It's got a particularly bad reputation, and then you know, and then they have to you know they they fall under the Springer umbrella. There's pressure to you know sell more issues and uh and uh these days in the olden days i mean in the olden days i mean like in the last few years uh uh <laughs> libraries were have been under a pinch because you know spring will say look you want any of our journals you got to get all of our journals Jeez. Yeah. so you have to buy these packages of journals uh and and now uh uh and uh and of course, what's happening is the universities can't afford it. They can't afford to buy these giant packages journals, and you can't buy the individual journals. You have to buy the package, mm -hmm. uh, or you can, sometimes you can, but they're they're way more. You know, the cost per journal is a lot higher. Yeah, uh, and so uh, what you know, and so they're losing money on these subscription to these big packages. So now what they're doing is they want they want you to pay for the the article to be open access to everybody. Oh yeah, I was gonna, I was going to ask about that. Yeah. Yeah, and so and so they say, look, we're giving you know, you've written the article, you know, for free. Someone else has refereed it for free, and what we want you to do is to give us three thousand dollars so anyone can read it. And of course, you know, some people have grants with that the money for that built in. <laughs> so uh, you know all my you know all my articles that are published with Springer are behind paywalls, uh, and you know, but you know on the other hand, <laughs> on the other hand, it's uh, you know, uh, uh, it's, it's not like there's huge amounts of money to be made from this anyhow. Right. Yeah. yeah That's I'm, still unfortunate, though. Is it like, 
Are you allowed to disseminate them yourself? Well, there are rules. You can't disseminate the official version. Okay. Like, so it was like the that, Springer but, logo but, but on that, it. But that's the, the citable version. That's the trick. So in order to cite it properly, uh, they, they have to, you know, you, you have to know the page numbers. Right. And, and there's often, you know, you know, two years down the road, you can, you know, you, 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 you can then, you know, and they have different copyright forms. I mean, there are different sorts of goals in publishing at different stages in your career. Okay. Early career person, you just want to get published. That's all. You, know, mm. you want to get it in a journal. As you become more late career, you, you, it's, it's not just getting it published. You actually want people to read for five years. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> so, you're, you know, I mean, you, know, the, you, know, you, you want to have a, you know, a, a little impact in the field. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it, it's, it really starts impacting, you know, if you're just getting published, and that's all you care about, well, you have no incentive to pay the $3,000 for the open access. There's, mm -hmm. there's no incentive for that. But if you want people to read read and write and teach your work then you know, well then yes you, you you do have some kind of incentive but i mean it's it's hard to know uh what difference that's going to make for an article in the philosophy of music <laughs> you know if i pay the three thousand dollars how many more people will read it mm -hmm. uh, and the answer is probably not very many uh but uh <clears throat> But uh, 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 and we're in a we're in a transitional period right now. We don't want to know what's. I mean, so I mean, there are a lot of people think, look, individual universities should sponsor journals and create open access electronic journals. So, like the University of Saskatchewan would have its own journal. That well, well, no, well, I mean, it, it would it, you know it wouldn't be its own journal. So uh, you know, there'd be a journal that's run by an organization. But the uh, University of Saskatchewan provides the infrastructure. Hmm. You know, they provide the computer space to, you know, you know, and, and sort of permanent computer space so the the journal can exist in the cloud. Right. Uh, in some you know in some form, uh, uh, where people can access it. Uh, and 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 the reality is, uh, you know, there's a lot of transitional costs, but. You're gonna, you know, you know, you need copy editing, and you need site management, uh, and you know they they often they now have this uh, uh, these manuscript platforms where you you don't submit articles to people, you submit it through this I can't remember what it's called this the, through this this platform uh, that sort of helps people keep track of stuff. I see. Uh, but you know, so you need a subscription, or you need a, some kind of program, submitting program. Uh, you need, uh, an, you know, administrative staff, some copy editing, you know, some copy editing money. But you know, uh, uh, and then you still have the free referee. Uh, you know, and, and people are more inclined to referee for independent journals. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, because I mean, increasingly, I mean, it's you know, j just because, uh, 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 I think why, I think it was, uh, we've just had this, uh, uh, brouhaha, I think it was the <laughs> journal of the journal of political philosophy. I think it was called, Okay. that was owned, I believe by Wiley, don't quote, quote me. And, you know, Wiley buys it up, the founding editor of the journal is still the editor and they want more articles published what, Wiley, sorry wiley or the wiley wants more okay, articles published yes. uh, because they get to charge the more more open access fees so mm -hmm. extra you know, they're thinking you know ultimately every extra article extra three thousand dollars uh you know or something like that mm. uh and uh you know and uh the the journal editors know look where we're trying to maintain standards we're only going to you know publish articles that meet our and they they fired the editor as a result and then wow. and then the whole board resigned the editorial board resigned and there was a you know you know it, there was a uh you know sort of online movement don't referee for 
uh, this journal. So they got boycotted. They got yeah. boycotted, and this the original editors is formed as new open access independent journal. Uh, and it looks like this journal uh, may be dead. Uh, and so there, there is there is some pushback against, I mean, because when you have someone like Springer, which I, I, I'm, Springer and Wiley are the two names that people mention as uh, the worst actors in this. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, and uh, they're profit driven rather than, you know, you know, driven by the dissemination of information. Yeah, right. And so, uh, uh, and, you know, when you have those two competing forces and the uh, the bean counters, again, are the ones in power, uh, you know, uh, but what they forget is that the whole system runs on people's free labor. The authors who provide the content and the referees who evaluate the content. And they forget that and thinking we're just trying to extract more money. Uh, uh, and they, I, I mean, they do have, you know, there are people who are desperate to publish because they think it's the only way to get a career, who are willing to, you know, put up with this. And that's and that's sort of where they the I mean this a uh, new tangent where the predatory journals come into play. Hmm. Uh, you know you know about that. Um, no, I thought you were well, referring. Like, would that be Springer and Wiley? That no, are... no. The predatory journals are worse than Springer. And oh Wiley. no. <laughs> uh, uh, the predatory journals are the journals that are basically vanity publishing uh, journals where they don't have any standards at all. Uh, oh. And they basically charge a fee to get for people to get published. So if you've got enough money, you can get your research out there. You, you, you can you can get your research out there. Okay. But they're you know, uh, you know, but they are you know, getting published there doesn't mean anything beyond that than that you paid the fee. Sorry, mm. I'm gesturing up here. No, no, it's okay. I just I think I forgot to plug my camera in. Sorry, so I'm just gonna make sure it's still plugged in. Want to make sure it doesn't die on um, us. And so uh, predatory journals are, and, and of course it's hard to tell, uh, you know, unless you know in advance what sort of journal you're, de you're dealing with. Yeah. Uh, and so there's a whole bunch, you know, they often have names similar to non predatory journals. So, I mean. Wow, really? Uh, uh, and so there's this whole issue of when you look at people's CVs and saying, okay, well, you've got these publications, and then you say, well, hold it. Are these legit publications? Mm -hmm. You know, are are these publications the product of a genuine uh, process of peer review by people who uh, you know understand the field? Mm -hmm. Like, what standard of rigor are they actually being held yeah. to? Yeah. And, and a lot a lot of the the predatory journals they're not being held to any standards of rigor rigor at all. Mm. Uh, so, so you know, there's there's a lot of pitfalls out there in the publishing and the publishing game I mean you know in philosophy we know who the big players are I mean they're, they're the old established journals we know we know what the good journals are mm -hmm. uh, and uh, yeah so I mean you know it, it's it's you know it's when you have a paper that you're struggling to get into like the top journal because the top journals have you know some of them have like five percent acceptance rates. Well, yeah. So you, you know, then you go down. You try and get to the places with like you know forty percent, but you know acceptance rate. But even, but but even you know even if you got rejected, uh, you know oftentimes it's it's a crapshoot. You know you get the wrong referees. So you you, know, you can't be a hunt. You know, some people just you know they hate views like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's a uh, lot of know, opinions. They, ha they have biases. Uh, or they don't didn't have time to read it carefully, uh, and you know so there's there's all sorts of ways that the the peer review system uh, uh, can go wrong. Uh, you, like democracy, it's 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 the least bad system. Uh, yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, uh, but uh, I'm trying to remember where, where I was going with this. Yeah. No. I mean. So I mean. There's lots of pitfalls. Uh, but uh, you know, once you know, once you've Look, start looking at lower tier journals because you think, well, this, 
yeah, this isn't a top journal article, but I want to publish it. I think it's publishable. And then that's when you start getting into these, you know, you know, you know here are some places and you, you put it here. It turns out maybe this is not the, the right place. You know, this is not a real place. Mm -hmm. uh, as I say, it's a, uh, uh, it's a, uh, you know, if you're in the know, uh, you know, and I, you know, I'm reasonably in the know. I, you know, there are a lot of journals I recognize. Uh, one, one clear sign that it's not legit is if they contact you asking for a paper. So, yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> well, you know, because it's it's it's, you know, it's clear that you know they you know the good the, the journals you want to publish in, uh, they don't need to solicit papers mm -hmm. because they're getting too many papers anyhow. So if you're getting a request for a paper, it's like, well, that's that's probably uh, probably not somewhere I want to publish something. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a, that's a good point. I'd never I never would have thought about that. With the journals, so you were talking about how um, with um, if you've got a journal in Springer, for example, you're allowed to give it out yourself, but it might not be a, a citable version. Mm -hmm. Is there anybody that um, has kind of just said? To hell with all of the system and is just self-publishing all of their work. And oh, I'm sure. I mean, I'm sure there are lots of people. Yeah. Uh, but the question is, and you know, I mean, you don't get. I mean, on your CV, you don't get the. You know the. Uh, credit for a publication, mm. and so if you're at a university, the self-publishing doesn't count for anything. Right. Yeah. Now, if you're an independent scholar, you don't care. Uh, or if you're tenured, <laughs> uh, yeah, you, you might not care. care. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, but, you know, so there's, you know, producing it, making it available, but getting people to read it is the, you know, is the hard part because mm -hmm. there's, there's, you know, and one of the, one of the reasons the journal system exists as a, is as a sorting, uh, a sorting hat uh, for determining which articles you should read. Look, if an article appears, you know, in Philosophical Studies, which is a very good journal, well, that gives me gives me confidence it's going to be worth reading. Hmm. If it occurs in this obscure website, well, you know, I've only got so much time to spend reading. I'm unlikely to read it. So, I mean, you, it's all well and good to self-publish. Uh, and, you know, but it doesn't mean anyone's ever going to read it. And so uh, that's one of the... Uh, uh, one of the reasons we have the journal system is because getting published in one of these venues puts a little sticker on your article worth reading. Yeah, well, that's the, that's the same idea as the university itself, right? Like, my, I can I, I have a, a bachelor's in arts and psychology, mm -hmm. so I could spend four years buying like going to the university website and finding the textbooks <clears throat> and reading all the same textbooks, but I can't take that to. A, um, a supervisor and say, I've got all the same knowledge as one of your grad students, let me do my master's. They're going to say, no, you no. need to go through the, the undergraduate exactly. program. So, you know, they need the, they, the credential mm -hmm. uh, uh, gives people, you know, gives people a certain confidence in uh, what they're, you know, in, in the product, if you yeah. can. Uh, that it, you know, it, it, it's met a certain threshold. And that's one of the reasons. Uh, you know, and and so there, you know there, there are hierarchies of journals. We we know what the best journals are, mm -hmm. and so if you got you know if you get published one of these top journals, you know, people are way more likely to read it and take it seriously than if you're published in a mid tier journal. I mean, uh, you know, I, I have publications in you know a variety of places, but you know you know uh, some of them are published in places where you know people will never read them. I mean, they say, okay, this is a uh, the Journal of the Canadian Philosophical Association is Dialogue, which is a perfectly respectable journal, but nothing high powered. And I've got some articles there, and you know, so publishing, you know, publishing in Dialogue, it means well, you got published. It means probably no one's ever going to read it. Mm. You know, they might happen across it, but odds are they won't. Yeah. Uh, so uh, you know, if you want to disseminate your work, it matters where you publish it, uh, and you know, you know, the the reputations. You know, for many of these journals are well earned. They're very exclusive in terms of what they'll accept. Uh, some of them are resting on their laurels from the past. You know, uh, that happens too. Yeah. Uh, and where you know they have a reputation for being a certain quality, but they no longer have articles of that quality. That happens. Yeah. Uh, but uh, you know, 
you know, the, uh, you know, and you might wish for a different system, a more egalitarian, some people wish for a more egalitarian system, but I mean, you know, you know, the, you know, this is, you know, this is the mindset of people in the profession. The good journals are the one, are, are, the articles in good journals are the articles one should read first. So if you want people to read your stuff, you should try and get your articles in the good journals. Hmm. Uh, well, where are the eyeballs, right? Where are people looking? So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, I mean, it's not the same game. The, it's not really the eyeball game. It's not, you know, it's, it's not so much how many people read it as who reads it. I mean, you know, you mm. know so if, you know, if uh, a player in the field, you know, like a big name cites your article, well, that's, that's good news because that means other people will read like uh Stephen Davis, a guy in the, in the philosophy of music, who I've, you know, uh, I think I, I think I got a citation out of him once, uh, uh, and, and so you know the fact that he cited it means people are more likely to read it. Yeah, okay, I'm following yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, huh. and so with these journals too, I like, um, I guess in terms of getting grants, does that that I would imagine plays into a big part into it as well when you're applying for a grant is showing. How where I you been? I, I don't. I don't apply for grants. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, you've already told me. Uh, I don't. No, I mean, look, uh, I was evaluating a Shirk grant proposal. So it's the Social Science and Humanities Research Council uh, grant proposal recently. So you know, I, I got asked to review a, a proposal, and part of the proposal is look, uh, given their past record, do they have the you know, publishing record, do they have the qualifications to carry out the project they're proposing? Hmm. And so in that way, past publications can help with at least some grants in that, in that they say, aha, the evaluators come by and say, aha, look, this person has the kinds of publications that suggest he or she has the background to carry out the new proposed research. And so, you know, I tick that box qualified hmm. that increases their possibility of getting grants so in, in that way yes okay uh, I mean uh, there are other kinds of grants uh, you know there's all sorts of grants from you know you know corporate grants you know individual organizations of various kinds and they all have different rules hmm. you know you know you know there can be I mean the uh, the Templeton Foundation has been putting grants out there which is uh, uh, it's a Christian organization, and so you 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 that uh, you know, where you get people philosophers getting grants for studying free will, but you've got to maintain that. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's, there's you know, and and people said, well, they don't interfere, but you know, in some ways that you know, the, there's, well, I got to take the religious perspective on free will more seriously if I take this money than I might otherwise be. Mm -hmm. So I mean, you have, you know, I mean. People have spoken very highly of the Templeton grants. They seem to have huge amounts of money for, uh, for things, uh, and they they support a lot of, uh, you know, uh, activities in philosophy. Uh, but I, you know, again, you know, other people sort of say, well, there is a, an agenda of this organization, mm -hmm. and whether you you know whether you get the grant or not depends in part on the extent to which you. Uh, your project and you, uh, you know, conform to their agenda. Mm. Well, so everyone's I mean, biased, right? So what's that? Everyone's got, nobody's without bias, I should <clears> say. <throat> Not everyone, nobody's without bias. And you don't want to bite the hand that's feeding you. Well, yeah, exactly. And so, you don't, you know, if, if you're going for those grants, yeah, you, the, you, you know, and some people say never go for those grants because of that. Mm. Other people say, well, you know, they've done well by us. Uh, you know, so... Uh, and I have no, you know, I have no first-hand knowledge of that. Just uh, there's discussion about the Templeton Foundation, uh, and you know they do seem to have a lot of money to give for grants in the humanities, which is a good thing. Mm. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, you know one worries about, uh, uh, you know, one worries about the influence of the kind of religious views that are that they endorse on the kind of research that comes out. Yeah. So, further to that, then I guess in a journal for like, yeah, I guess if there's a journal that has maybe people are starting to notice that it has kind of a leaning in one direction and an opinion, do people find that 
you're more likely to get published if you're already published with them a bunch of times and kind of contributing to the, the well, ideas that they already it, like. This is why they have blind review. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> uh, what they also do now, I think it's called triple blind review. I can't remember what the, what the third level of blindness is, but uh, the, the, the most extreme form of blindness is that even the editors don't know who sent the article in. Mm. So normally the referees don't know who the author is. Uh, and so the, I guess the author you know, anonymizes the article. And then the referees don't know who the author is. And then the editors don't even know who the, who, who the author is. And so if you have those kinds of processes you know, you know, set up, then it's going to be harder for uh, the, uh, you, know, you know, I mean, because one, uh, one of the biases people used to complain about was biases in favor of famous people. Mm. So, you know, a journal uh, gets a submission from a famous philosopher. Well, they want to, they want to publish it because it's good to have the famous you know you it increase you know, when people see the famous philosophers publishing here, then uh huh it, it gives it creates the impression it's a better journal. So uh, there was a lot of worry about that. And in the old you know in the olden days, I mean when there wasn't you know you know blind refereeing, uh, well you know famous people would get published more easily. Mm. Uh, you know and you know you know and in you know for reasons that you know didn't have, didn't reflect the quality of their work. Uh, yeah. But uh, so increasing, bl you know, <clears throat> increasing blinding of the refereeing process has, you know, can, can avoid some of those issues. I mean, there are, I mean, there are going to be in the discipline uh, certain general biases in favor of a favor of certain views sometimes and so you, you know if you're adopting a certain kind of position you might you know just because of the nature of you get you know, you know of the view you're defending say you know people not necessarily for arguments but because of you know what people are talking about what what people approve of or disapprove of it might get a, a negative result for reasons like that yeah but the more direct uh you know bias in most journals is has been i mean uh dealt with to a certain extent i mean the uh the one thing that's tricky is that is that if you submit an article that you've presented before under the same title referees will google the title see who the oh, okay is. yeah yeah uh, Hmm. I mean, and so you so you you have these, and you agree not to Google, Google the title. Yeah, yeah, you have to uh, read it and not look into it further, and yeah, right. yeah, yeah. okay. Um, oh shoot, sorry, it just I just lost my train of thought there. Um, yeah, I, I can't remember where it was going, but um, but oh, it was um about the bias. So the bias that still remains in these journals. Um, do you think that a lot of it is? Intentional, or it's just people that it's just somewhere in their well. Subconscious. I mean, I mean, I mean, there's a whole literature on implicit biases. Mm. I mean, uh, and I think most people think these days that the concern is implicit bias. And apparently, I mean, this is not something I've paid a whole lot of attention to. There are questions about how we should understand implicit bias. Is it really the problem people say it is? I have no views on that. Th mm. Those questions, because I haven't really looked into it it is common you know it, it's common academic wisdom uh that there is such a thing and that it needs to be battled uh but i mean as i say uh it's not something i you know explored uh you know i you know, I, you know i've looked into so i don't have anything sensible to say about it mm. uh, uh and uh you know and you know there's a you know there's a question after double triple blind uh you know you know uh, you know, you double or triple blind the the, the refereeing process. You know, can implicit bias still step in? Well, you know, maybe. I I think this is written in the style of a woman, you know, or or a member of some, some minority group. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you know, and then because I think that, then I might have you know my implicit biases might come out, and I might you know you know be less likely to approve it. But of course, you know. 
it may not be true that there's any uh, genuine style that you can associate with members of these groups. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, the blinding process, I mean, I think it's the best you can do. I mean, you know, I'm sure there are people who think we can do more in certain ways, but uh, uh, but I think that's you know, and and most, if not all, I'm sure there are journals that 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 I'm sure there are journals that that don't blind authors for referees. I'm sure there are some out there, mm. but that they would be very rare, and I don't know how widespread the triple blinding is, where the editors don't know who it is. Uh, I don't know how widespread that is. Okay. I mean, it's something that people have been talking about, but it makes it, you know, well, uh, it, it would probably result in certain administrative difficulties. Yeah, I would imagine. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, in particular, you might receive a request to referee your own paper. Mm. If the editors don't know who who it is and the editors are going to be the ones who you know you know you you could leave the re finding a referee to the administrators but the administrators you know the, whoever the administrator is the editorial assistant are not necessarily well placed to make judgments about who the best referees would be okay yeah so there are, there are complications there yeah well wow. all right so you've your academic career has been in philosophy. Your professional career has been in philosophy. I'm, I know I'm jumping off topic a little bit here, but was it was this always a clear cut path from an early age that you wanted to go into this realm of study, or did it just happen randomly one day? Or? My undergraduate degree was in chemistry and math. Okay, so not your entire no academic uh, career. No, I was I was more a science. Uh, you, know, you know, in high school I did well at science and the humanities. We didn't have philosophy in high school, okay. uh, but I you know I did well in both. But then I in, in university I was. Very much a science kid. Oh, okay. Uh, the the only philosophy course I took uh, as an undergrad was uh, my sister got me into this the uh, uh, a course in political philosophy uh, with this professor Thomas Pangle, and Pangle was one of you know he was in the political study political science department and he was one of the the Strosian philosophers philosophers. I've never heard of that. Well, the Stro there's this Leo I, I think it's Leo Strauss who felt that these ancient texts had you know were sort of you know had these sort of secret meanings for the elite mm. uh, and so there was the, the superficial meaning for the hoi polloi uh, and your, your your job as an interpreter was to discover the secret meaning for the elite interesting uh, and uh, so it was a you know and so it was he, this guy Pangle was he was a fabulous lecturer he, he made all these texts seem just deep and fascinating interesting and I realized I was terrible at philosophy because I, <laughs> I couldn't I couldn't do this and so uh, he got me interested but convinced me that I couldn't do it uh, and so uh, how did I end up in philosophy I mean you know it's, it's one of these things that you sort of have you know you know I should do that that sounds interesting but I was convinced I couldn't uh, and uh, you know my mid twenties, I you know, after my undergrad degree, I decided I was done with higher education. Uh, Entered a period I affectionately refer to as the lost years. Mm. Uh, <laughs> uh, I did a uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, sort of low end jobs. Uh, uh, you know, you know, working in the retail. You know, not the retail industry. Well, even the retail industry at some point, but you know, working in the service industry. I was a, uh, I like to joke, a professional sandwich maker. Oh uh, yes, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and uh, and uh, then I did a year long walkabout. Uh, uh, lived with my father for a year while working, and okay. then. Okay. And sorry, this is bef you said before university or after? After, you're after university, before I went into philosophy. Okay. And so, and so I did a year long walkabout. Uh, and uh, you know, you know the high way. But I, I have cousins who've been in a religious community in India since the '60s, uh, in Pondicherry, where the life of Pi starts. Okay, yeah. Uh, and uh, so I, you know, and I ended up working at a hostel in Athens for four months, wow. uh, hauling hauling tourists off trains for because I was stuck waiting for a visa to go to India. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. So hauling tourists off trains for ha for free accommodation and half price drinks at the bar <laughs> yeah. it was a lot of fun. Uh, uh, and I, when I got back, you know, af after the you know, the the year long years away, I, I, I again went back to sort of, you know, 
low-end jobs. Uh, and uh, But I started taking some courses part-time at Dalhousie. My, my, I grew up in Halifax, so you know, I, my father's house was around the corner from Dalhousie. Uh, and <clears throat> I ended up taking it. Uh, actually, it was a course in the philosophy of art uh, with Stephen Burns. Uh, and uh, so I take this course. I, I liked it. It was a good course. Uh, and I decided, however, that it was time to get on with my life. And I was going to decide I'm going to go to law school hmm. because both my parents were lawyers. Uh, and I went to the, you know, as, as I tell the story, I went to the Dalhousie Law School to get the application material. And as I was walking back, uh, there was the philosophy department in front of me. Uh, now it's it's sort of true. I think I'd had it in my back of my mind. I might you know I might try and do a master. So I show up September first. I'd like to do a master's in philosophy. They said, well, you know, maybe next year. Mm. So I took a few more courses and uh, uh, you know managed to get in. And, and and it turned out what they were doing was how my brain worked. So aha, uh -huh, this was this was right for me. And uh, you know. I wasn't. I never had the idea that I was going to be doing a career in it. I mean, these were getting the master's in philosophy, life accomplishment. Hmm. Decided to go on to the PhD. D did I think I'd be a professor at the end of the day? Well, I mean, the, the possibility crossed my mind, but you know, again, life accomplishment. Uh, uh, but as I, you know, as I did them, you know, did these things, I, you know, I discovered I was good at it and that I enjoyed it. So. Yeah, so I I stuck with it, and I, I had no regrets. I mean, you know, uh, getting getting into a position, a tenure stream position, a philosophy department. That's that's a that's a low probability proposition. I've heard that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, you know, you have to be able to finish. You know, I, I had to write a master's thesis at Dalhousie. I had to be able to finish it. I had to write a, a dissertation at the University of North Carolina. I had to be able to finish it. And many people, and you never know who it's going to be, just can't finish these things. Hmm. I mean, it's you know, it's, you know, the dissertation particularly. It's basically, you know, you you take some coursework and they say, now go write a book, and come back when you're done. Hmm. Yeah, that's and, quite the undertaking. It's it's yeah. I mean, and you have access to your supervisors and the like. But but yeah, basically, it's you writing a book. And a lot of people, especially at the, you know, that's why they say, uh, you know, many people are ABD, all but dissertation, <laughs> uh, where they discover that, no, this isn't going to happen. And they, but they don't know. I mean, that, you know, uh, my favorite story about this, and, you know, you know, how long it can go on was when I was at North Carolina, there was this guy, Terry Moore. And he'd been there for a while. He was a mysterious figure. The only evidence you had of his existence, you'd come in and you'd, there'd be tobacco in an in a ashtray in an office. <laughs> oh, th this is, you know, Terry Moore sign. Excuse me. <coughs> <coughs> this may be the cat. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. I, I, th I actually thought I'd better take a pill before I came out, then I forgot. We can pause for a moment if you. Yeah. No, no, I'm fine. Um, but uh, so, uh, I, and I was very proud to have actually met Terry Moore. You know, one of the few grad students you know of my younger generation, and much to everyone's surprise, in 1993, Terry Moore defended his dissertation, and graduated, and the story arose. So he defends he defends in 1993, and the story arose that he had been asked, "Where were you when Nixon resigned?" And his answer was sitting right here. 19 years, but he finished. But what often happens is people, <clears throat> they start and they don't finish, but they don't give up either. And mm -hmm. so it can go on for years and years and years. <clears throat> it can go on for years and years and years and then never get anything at the end. And uh, <clears throat> these days, uh, they... They have time limits. They'll say, no, <laughs> we're going to kick you out at mm -hmm. a certain point. Yeah. And they do that. They, they have that at, at the University of Saskatchewan. They have a, you know, for a master's, there's a five-year time limit. Hmm. <clears throat> yeah, I didn't know that there wasn't one at any point. I would have just assumed that 
that would have been something that they've always had. But I guess that makes sense, right? Like you don't want like people have to have supervisors and you take up spots that other people if, if you're right if well, it looks at, like you're not at, a, get at to a certain it. point at a certain point you're not doing anything that's costing the supervisor any time because mm-hmm. i mean the you know, what costs supervisors time is when people turn in chapters of dissertation which the supervisor mm-hmm. has to, has to you know has to read and comment on if you're not turning anything in you're just a name on a list for the supervisor okay <clears throat> so I mean, uh, if you're turning in a lot of crap that gets rejected and you're constantly turning it, well, that's, that's the kind of long-term case that, you know, that people don't want to deal with. Yeah. And so when, you're, mm-hmm. when you are turning things in, when you're working on your, you're at the point where you're working on a dissertation, is it by the time you've handed it in, is that kind of like its final... No, no, you, or you, you, doing... you turn in chapters as you go. I mean, oh, okay. if, you, if you have a good committee, I mean, I, I had two co-chairs of my, two co-supervisors, uh, Keith Simmons and Bill Lichen. Uh, and, you know, both of them were willing to read stuff as he went and talk okay. to you about stuff as he went. So, you know, <clears throat> uh, you know, you turn in a draft of chapter one, you comments back, you turn a chapter, you know, and then you do revised versions of the various chapters and, Eventually, getting to the point where <clears throat> you're you're ready to defend, mm-hmm. uh, you know, and you know, at, at a, you know, and of course there are these, you know, some people would never finish except your funding's going to run out at a certain point, and so there are these these incentives, and and you know, you know, and you have to focus on timing, you know, because you want to finish, you, you you ideally you want to defend and then have a job set up for the next year, right. So you have to, you know, so you basically have to go on the market in the last year of writing when you're, cl- you know, you're going to finish, mm-hmm. and so your letter writers can say, he's going to finish. So then someone will hire you so that you seamlessly have a job after you're finished. Your funding in grad school runs out. Yeah, you can take <clears> a <throat> step. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. What was what was your dissertation? My uh, dissertation was on. Uh, uh, belief sentences it was in the philosophy of language uh the issue is i'll, I'll give you a uh, i'll give you a real case uh <clears throat> george eliot wrote middlemarch true marianne evans is george eliot same person so marianne evans wrote middlemarch is also true mm. since the first one's true the second one's true okay Put that in a belief sentence. Fred believes that George Eliot wrote Middlemarch. Okay? True. Uh, I suppose. But it could, it, could, it could be false that Fred believes that Marianne Evans wrote Middlemarch. Mm, okay. So, you know, so, so question. If the, what the name contributes to what's said the proposition expressed is just the person okay well then you know looks like in the ordinary case without the belief you know you know if one's true the other's true so the two you know mary Evans wrote middle march means the same thing as george Eliot wrote middle march so both are true uh but given that you can't substitute a co-referential name inside a belief report and get the same truth value the names are got to be behaving differently inside belief sentences hmm. that you know that's that's sort of the the basic puzzle some people call it Frege's puzzle after Gottlob Frege a late 19th possibly early 20th century philosopher of language mostly in the late 19th I think he was alive in the early 20th century but uh, <clears throat> I believe he went mad near the end of his life okay yeah uh, I have a lot of a lot of those guys back around that yes. time yeah so uh, so there was, you know, you know, there that was the problem space, uh, and uh, uh, you know that was the problem, and uh, uh, and uh, uh, a lot of stuff been written on that. You know, it's a, sort of an old, it was a little old fashioned by the time I got to it, but you know, it was an old problem, uh, and uh, yeah. So I mean, uh, trying to make sense of what's going on in those kinds of cases, uh, in terms of you know, from a philosophy of language perspective where you at the question is 
what does the mean you know what is the meaning or what what's the contribution of the name to the proposition expressed by a sentence and there's reason to think well that for some you know that that these cases show that the meaning shifts in one context or context the mean the name has one kind of meaning and another in a belief context it has a different kind of meaning okay uh, so yeah. so just because two names represent something equivalently just because the nomenclature is the same that doesn't that because the nomenclature is not the same you can't necessarily interchange them you, can, well, you, you can't in belief reports mm. because Marion Evans George Eliot both refer to the same person but in a belief sentence I you know if I replace George Eliot with Marianne Evans I can go from a true sentence to a false sentence mm -hmm. so they the two sentences if, if one's true and one's false they can't mean the same thing okay well, okay and so is the the belief difference from the... but, but I mean it's the belief report okay yeah and so in in, in the in belief just being whether you think something to be true regardless right. of whether it is yeah okay uh, so yeah, 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 sure so I mean you know I can believe that George Eliot wrote, you know, so the sentence, Allward believes George Eliot wrote Middlemarch. Mm. That can be true. And the sentence, Allward believes uh, uh, Marianne Evans wrote Middlemarch, can be false mm. if I don't realize that George Eliot is Marianne Evans. Okay. But, so, but the, quest, the, the semantic question is, what does the word George Eliot, what does the word Marianne Evans mean? Mm. Because if one sentence is true and one sentence is false they have to mean something different because if, if if both sentences meant the same thing then one couldn't be true and the other couldn't be false because they mean the same thing uh, but we don't have that you know if you leave the belief off George Eliot wrote Metal March because George Eliot is Marian Evans it's automatically true yeah. that Marian Evans wrote Middle March so question you know f you know what is going on with the meaning of these terms in different contexts in which they appear? Do we have a shift in meaning or something else going on? Wow, that's really interesting. And so, if, if I'm following you correctly, the idea is that you can change the truism of something based on whether it's something that's being believed or something that just is. Well, just to be careful, the a claim attributing beliefs to you can be true or false, whether you believe belief that I attribute to or right. not. Okay. Okay. So, okay. so the claim, yeah. so the claim is, you know, you know, it can be true of you that you believe Marianne Evans wrote Middlemarch, or it could be false of you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I'm false. So, yeah, so, yeah, so, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. so it's a, it's a claim. It's a, you know, the, you got a claim. It's a belief report. It's a report of your beliefs, and that that claim can be true or false depending on whether I've got your psychology right. Mm -hmm. Uh, so you know, and so you know, it's it's this rich little area, sort of focused on you know, focused on uh, uh, on uh, you know, names, one type of expression in belief reports, one type of context, but it has all these broader implications. Uh, uh, but yeah, uh, uh, and uh, I had fun with that. I published a few things after that, but it was you know, the topic was you know, you know, they, they don't tell you. What to write on? They just they have to approve what you write mm. on. Uh, but you know, in some ways, you know, I mean, the the topic was dated. But basing your dissertation topic on what you think is going to be hot when you're done, rather than what you're interested in, is a good way not to finish your dissertation. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I mean, you know, step A. Find something you're interested enough in that you're going to finish it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we can. And yeah, so I don't, I don't regret writing the dissertation on the topic, but I mean, it was, you know, you know, especially because I was a junior, you know, like when I was done, it was hard to publish because I was a junior person who didn't have the the skill set for turning dissertations into journal articles. Mm. You have to develop those, but also because it was a dated topic and no one really wanted. You know, it was in the seventies; it was all the rage. Yeah. Uh, but this was the this was the nineties and early two thousands uh, when it wasn't all the rage. And so when you when you're writing this and trying to go over over it all, a dissertation is, is very large. Was it? Did, did you already know? Well, I assume you already knew about this topic, but was it hard to kind of wrap your brain around what you were going to put in your dissertation as you were going along, or did you just kind of? Well, know? I mean. Y y 
you have to defend a proposal before you start. You say, here's what I'm, here's what my, here's my topic. Here's how I'm going to go about it. So you, you have to go through this process to get, you know, to get, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, and here are the chapters I'm going to have in it. So you, you have to, you know, and, and at North Carolina, which is not true everywhere, you have to defend it not just in front of your committee, you have to defend it in front of the entire faculty. Oh, wow. Which is unusual, uh, which makes it quite intimidating. Uh, but yeah, so, uh, you know, so you have everyone in the department hearing what your topic is and, you know, and it's, it's, it's a, you know, you, you can get rejected. I mean, mine didn't get rejected, but it's gotta be a, you know, you know, a, a real topic. You gotta, you gotta show that you know what you're talking about, even though you don't yet, because you mm -hmm. haven't really started on it. Yeah, yeah. And that it's, you know, and the, the, the other thing they're concerned with is, you know, you know, that is the, the topic small enough. Cause one of the other best ways not to finish dissertation is to have a topic that's too big. Mm -hmm. Because uh, I mean, we you know, and there, there was a guy in my class who who did that, and they let him do it, and of course he never finished. I mean, you know, and that, you know, that, that's one of the roles of the of your committee is to say no, you can't do all of that. That's a life's work, not a dissertation. Mm. Uh, and uh, people people don't like being told that, but you know, but you know, you have to have something narrow enough. And even my little narrow topic was a topic that you know, I mean, I, I wrote over 200 words on it mm. you know it was it was, a, it was a substantial it was two to three hundred words somewhere mm. uh two to three hundred not words pages i was gonna ask okay <laughs> yeah, sorry yeah, that, uh, as i said that that doesn't sound right it was two to three hundred pages yeah uh yeah no two three hundred words would be fairly easy yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes yeah we'd so, all have dissertations if we could write two or three hundred yes. words <laughs> yeah so i mean uh you know uh you have a plan and you know you can change your plan as long as your committee approves it but you know you, you, your plan includes here are the chapters i'm going to do and then you just you know i just i just start okay let's start with let's start with the first chapter and then move on uh and so uh and you know it's it's you know you're reading a lot of stuff for each chapter and you know i would i would read a lot of stuff uh there were, as I said, I had two faculty members in the early stage as my supervisors. In the early stages, Keith Simmons, I, you know, I worked more with him, just sort of on the nuts and bolts of things. And in the later stages, I worked more with the other guy, Bill Lykin, on sort of broader themes in the literature. I okay. Uh, so they, it worked out quite well for me. Uh, but I, you know, early on, I would meet with uh, Keith and we'd talk about some articles, and then I would, after you know. You know, when I was ready, I'd write a draft, turn it into both of the the supervisors, and then while they were taking their time to get comments back, I'd work on the next chapter. Mm. Uh, and uh, it took me, I think, two and a half years writing. Okay. I think yeah. I, th I I I I wonder if that's true. I think that might be true. Because I. I I'm trying to think what you know it was. Uh, when my defense was, because I, I ended up taking uh, seven years on my uh, dissertation, or my, my doctorate. I, in part, you'll laugh, uh, in Canada, the system is, you do your undergraduate, you go do your master's somewhere, and then you typically go do your, 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 your doctorate somewhere else. Okay. In the, the States, the pattern is you do your undergraduate and then you go directly into a, a, a doctoral program which has a master's as a part oh, okay so it's it's sort of a, a you know you know masters you, you enter the program there's a master's and if you don't get the, you know they, they can kick you out after you if you're not doing well enough to the master's but and then you go on to the phd now and it's all the same project it's it well no it's it, it, it's it's you know the master's project is you know can be a different doesn't have to be the same project okay. you know it, you know it's, some people have them combined some people work on different topics mm. i worked on different topics but uh but in order to get if you want to get a job you want to get into a good program and as a canadian getting into a good program you know often requires having a master's already so i have two master's degrees in philosophy Oh, okay. Because I got one at Dalhousie, and then at North Carolina, as part of their, you know, you have to do their whole program. 
there's a master's oh, as a part. Okay. So I I have two master's degrees in philosophy. Mm. Uh, you know, just uh, you know, given that I was coming from the Canadian system, which worked yeah. one way, down to the American system, which worked another way. Uh, yes, uh, and uh, so the reason I'm saying that is the reason it took seven years is because I really had to you know redo the masters. Okay, I see. Okay, and that's really interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah. And sorry, continue. I just yeah, I was, that's interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, uh, uh, and you know, and we uh, some Canadians. I mean, t t Toronto, which is probably the best philosophy department in Canada, which is also, you know, one of the better you know university programs, you know, in the world. I mean, it's you know, it's it's, it's world ranked. Mm -hmm. Uh, they tend to move more towards the American model now, you know, where, say, where you can do the direct entry into the PhD program. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, most of the rest of the Canadian programs still have that. You know, your, you know, your, the master's is separate from the PhD. Mm -hmm. And some people do them both at the same place, but you know, more often than not, people do the master's somewhere and then the PhD somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And is that just a um, like the schools not wanting to take their own master students in, or is that people just trying to get experience in different uh, places? Or I mean, it's there's a lot of different things. I mean, but there there is there is the you know if you do your undergrad, your masters, and your dis and your doctorate all at the same place. Uh, it sort of looks well. I, I don't know if this person, you know, if just has a buddy here or if they're actually really. Oh, I see. I mean, yeah. uh, you know, you know, and and have they been exposed to a wide variety of views, or are they just very, you know, they are exposure to just what people at this one university do? Mm. So I mean, that uh, there's a a general sense that it's a good idea to. You know, in Canada, to, to do your, your you know your undergrad somewhere. Your master's somewhere else, your PhD some third place. Hmm. I mean, that's sort of the, the, the. I mean, some people do undergrad, master's, doctor back at the same place. I mean, you, know, you, you do get that. But having uh, having some kind of break from just being in one place is, is is considered. I mean, it's considered better. Now, it, it also depends on what that place is. I mean, if it's the University of Toronto where you did all these things, well, people might say, okay. We understand why you did that. Yeah, uh, but I'm trying. Let me, let me try, we don't have a, a PhD program in philosophy at the University of Saskatchewan. No, let me try and think of a, a, a school which might, where it might be suspect. If it's the University of Windsor, say, uh, I shouldn't. I shouldn't. I don't know anything about the University of Windsor <laughs> philosophy <laughs> program, but it's small mm. and it's not as well regarded as other programs. Right. Whether or not that's fair or not, I have no idea. Mm. I don't really. Uh, I don't think I know who teaches at the University of, of Windsor. Only that. Uh, as an undergrad, I believe uh, I, I'm not sure if this is still true. I think I think they used to have a medical school. I don't know if they still do. Windsor, but uh, I don't I don't know. Okay, uh, and, and this is me relying on memory from the '80s. Mm. Uh, <laughs> so 40 years ago, I, you know, uh, but I you know it, it was it was considered to be okay. I was an undergrad. I uh, you know, uh, I was at a you know, new college in residence and. Uh, a lot of kids wanted to go to medical school. It was like, look, well, if you can't get anywhere else, you go to, you go to Windsor. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, but uh, well, that's the old joke, right? It's like, what's the difference between the uh, what's the difference between the student that got a fifty one and the one that got a ninety nine? So there's no there's no difference. They're both doctors. Right. So, yeah. Right. 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 Yeah. I think you go, got to do better than fifty one to get. Yeah, we'd hope so. Yeah, I don't know. If you're in medical like... school, I, yeah. I, I, but uh, uh, as I say, uh, the, the the marginal pass. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, can you? Uh, I I wanted to ask you more about the um, the topics that you're doing that you're working on now. But if you will excuse me for just a moment, I use the washroom. Okay. And then we'll continue. Um. Yeah. I think I said as as, as I was walking out. I, I was, I'm interested in the topics you're working on quite a bit now, especially the the metaphysics of fiction. And so, you did your your dissertation um, on. The sentences of belief and then and you've got two master's degrees and you do your doctorate how do you go from that topic to what you're working on now well the 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 easy way to see it is in terms of uh 
thinking about belief reports about things that don't exist. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, so I mean, so so I mean, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's all well and good to talk about you know beliefs about things that do exist, but when you start having beliefs about things that don't exist. Then you know that was sort of something I didn't really take up in my dissertation. It was you know, the, and so you know all you know, and once you start talking about things that don't exist, then you're in the the territory of uh, fictional characters. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, one thing what one thing we know about Sherlock Holmes is no such guy. Yeah, right. And so uh, that was sort of the uh, the way in. And uh, uh, what got me started, uh, I've been talking about this for a while, and my. Uh, when I was uh, I was at the University of Lethbridge for 14 years before I came here, and the uh, chair of the department there, John Woods, invited me to help co-write a piece uh, on on fiction, which sort of got me started. Uh, you know, I've been sort of talking about it for a while, but it was really something I needed to, the the fire under my butt to get mm-hmm. me to start doing, uh, and so that's what got me going. But it was but it really was it was continuous and. Uh, I was uh, tempted by accounts of of uh, uh, statements about fiction. So, like you know, say Sherlock Holmes, you know, is a detective or was a detective. You know, you know, understanding or or in the Holmes stories, Sherlock Holmes is a detective. Understanding that in terms of uh, you know, sort of you know, you know, being disguised reports of belief, like the narrator of. The Sherlock Holmes stories believes that Sherlock Holmes is a is a is a, is a detective. Mm-hmm. So doc, in that case, Doctor Watson. Uh, so I mean, understanding claims about what goes on in fictional stories on the model of what happens in belief sentences. But so I have these two motivations: thinking about beliefs about things that don't exist, and also accounts of fiction uh, that understand them in terms of the beliefs of some narrator figure. Uh, so those two conspired. That was, that, that's sort of how I started out uh, thinking about things. Uh, uh, I even ended up writing a book that was sort of inspired by uh, inspired by you know that idea. Uh, I'm starting on a new book, uh, uh, which I ha- in which I have a very different approach. But uh, but yeah, that's how I got into it. It was it was it really it emerged out of the project out, out of the old project. Uh, in, sort of, in, in, in a fairly natural way, it was the mm. next place to go. Yeah. yeah, I saw your book on your website. Is that I've, I've, I wanted which, to, which one? The um, there's I, two. There's uh, empty revelations and philosophical problems. Okay, no, this one had a different. Maybe it wasn't a book. It was like the oh no, I think this was an article. It was like the thoughts of perceptions of and beliefs of fiction. I think was, what's what was it called? Um, I should have wrote it down. No, I thought it was. I thought it was a book. It was something. It was just like um, it looked like it was just a general um, outline of how people perceive fiction. But I'm, oh, uh, I mean, you know, uh, oh, uh, empty revelation the subtitle. Uh, uh, talk about an attitude towards yeah, fiction. Yeah, yeah, that was the book I was talking. Okay. About. Okay. Yeah, yes. So, so it's the sub the subtitle. Right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's the one I remember. I was going to ask: Is that something that I like as a layman? I would be able to pick up and go over, or because I wanted to pick it up, but I figured I should ask you first. Yeah, I mean, it's you. You might understand some of it. I mean, it's yeah. it's written for an academic audience, but as I say, I, I pride myself on my clarity. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, you know, uh, it's I, I try to avoid the the technical formula, you know. You know, so a lot of you know, you know, you know, a lot of people formulate things or less you know, less so these days than they used to. But in terms of complex uh, uh, formulas from symbolic logic, mm-hmm. so that you know, there's there's none of that stuff in it. Okay. Uh, I I think it's pretty clear. I mean, you know, you, you, without. You won't get all of it. Yeah. Uh, You're not going to offend me. Don't worry. No, no, but, but you won't. But just because you don't have the background. Yeah. I mean, it's you know, there's you know, there's. I I think it's a fairly friendly read, but still, you know, if you don't have the background, some of it's going to be uh, a bit mystifying. Mm-hmm. Uh, but no, I think I, I think it's uh, you know, uh, uh, re, you know, it is aimed at an academic audience, uh, uh, and uh, you know, but. Uh, uh, as I say, reasonably successful. 
Yeah. I mean, I mean uh, there were there were two reviews. They were both positive. Uh, well, I think yeah, I'm gonna check it out then because I'm like I said, I'm interested in that topic. And so, but that's my that's my old view. It's not my new view. Okay. Let's uh, let's tell me about the what's the what's the difference then I guess between that and what you think now. Well, my old view was very much uh, you know again a kind of an old fashioned view uh, where. Uh, I understood uh, claims about fiction on the model of belief reports. Uh, I borrowed from the uh, you know the the philosophy of Gottlob Frege distinguishes between the uh, the you know the the meaning and the reference of of, of an expression, and thinking well the, the meaning doesn't you know so you can have meaning without reference mm. uh, uh, that kind of idea uh, and. Uh, very much anti-realist in its orientation about fictional characters. There are no such things uh, as fictional characters. And so our claims about fictional characters don't have reference. They can't because there's nothing for them to refer to. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, you know, you know that, that, that was a line. And so uh, uh, I treated the, you know, treated fictional names in, in you know, you know, as disguised definite descriptions in a certain way they're you know, though they're they're disguised descriptions that aren't really referring to anything okay. uh, which is a and you know uh, there there's some good stuff in that book i mean you know there, there you know i i spent a lot of time on it there's you know there's uh, i still go back and you know mine it for some ideas uh but i you know i i, I mean it, it was a perfectly good book of its kind. I, you know, here, here's what I like to say. Uh, I wrote the book I wanted to write. Yeah, well, that's okay. good, right? Yeah. yeah. So you know, it, it it ended up being the book that I wanted to write, mm. uh, and you know, it's it had no impact whatsoever. <laughs> uh, you know, you know, I I'm sure a few people read it, but not very many, and mm. no, you know, you know, very few citations down the road. Nobody paid that much attention to it. Uh, and you know, which is all. You know, I mean, I, I did publish some of the same material in articles at the same time. So I mean, uh, the articles did better than the book. Mm. Uh, but you know, it's a book. You know, there it is. It's an accomplishment. Yeah. Uh, so I was I was happy enough to get it uh, to get a book published. Uh, so and you know, I you know, there, there's sort of three. There's two main views, and then the view, I, the old-fashioned view I was defending. There, mm. There's the, the, you know, there's the pretense view associated with uh, uh, Kendall Walton, uh, where we understand fiction in terms of uh, on the model of game, uh, ch children's games of make believe. Uh, and then there's uh, the fictional realism, uh, you know, the the idea that look, we can think and talk talk about fictional characters, so. They exist. They're not concrete flesh and blood human beings. They're cultural artifacts of a certain kind. Mm -hmm. uh, and so those are sort of the two. You know, then then's my third view. You know, the the third approach, which is the old fashioned one that I was defending, the 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 Fragian approach. Uh, 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 and uh, my new project is in fact involving combining the. The make-believe model with the fictional realism. Okay. Uh, and uh, the you know there's a, a a number of elements to it. Uh, so Walton talks about the notion of a prop in a game of make-believe. Think about a prop in a play. So uh, I saw a, a play. I saw a version of Macbeth put on by five actors. And the only props they had was one chair and one scarf. And but the chair was a prop for a lot of different things. Yeah, right. Yeah. It could be a horse. It could be a table. It could be all sorts of things. And so you know, it's a prop. And so you're supposed to imagine of it that it's you know. So in this scene, you're supposed to imagine of that 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 chair, that it's a that it's a horse. Uh, something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Uh, and. <clears throat> You know, so Walton's whole idea is, look, fictional works are props in game of games and beliefs. So you're supposed to imagine of them, you know, like a, a fictional story that is a report of actual events. 
Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Okay. Uh, now, one thing that's interesting is that sometimes, think of the home stories, they, you know, real things can appear in fictional stories. So the city of London is where the home stories are set. Right, so it's set in London. Not a city called London. They're set in London. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you know, one natural thing to say, look, in the, for the home stories, the prop is not just the story, but the city of London as well is another prop in the same game. Mm. You're supposed to imagine of London, of the, the stories, the reports of actual events, and you're supposed to imagine of the city of London that this is where these events occur, the reported events occur. And you know you, you can have you know you can have other you know, I found this great example, uh, 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 what's his name? Elliot Roosevelt, the son of Theodore or is it Franklin. Oh, okay. And what's, what's Franklin's wife's name? Eleanor. Yes. And Eleanor Roosevelt. He wrote a series of detective novels starring his mother. I did not know that. Well. Well, they're obscure. <laughs> I, was lo- I was looking for an example. I found this wonderful example. Uh, the first one's murder of the first lady. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. And and so you're supposed to imagine of the story that's a report of actual events, but you're supposed to imagine of Eleanor Re- Roosevelt itself, herself that she's the protagonist of the story. So 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 you know you have got these two props. You know, you know, it's not it's not just the, the 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 story that's a prop. Eleanor Roosevelt herself is a prop. Mm-hmm. Okay, and you know, and, and as a result, you know, facts about Eleanor Roosevelt that are described in the story are are part of what you imagine. You you, you bring facts about her into in in, in into the story because she's you know, it's a story about her. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I thought, well, hold it. What about cases where a character who originally appeared in one story then appears in a subsequent story. And I said, well, that character is going to be a prop in the game of make-believe for the the, the sequel. Yeah, right. Okay. okay, as well, playing the same kind of role that Eleanor Roosevelt plays. And so my inclination has been kind of anti- I'm, you know, I'm an anti-realist. I don't think fictional characters exist. But... Then I sort of say, well, hold it. Maybe you got to say you got to be a sort of a modest realist because characters play the role of props in the same way that real people play the role of props. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, trying to incorporate the idea of characters from other stories or you know, other fictional works appearing as props in games for you know sequels, if you like, mm-hmm. and that that's sort of the basic idea. Uh, uh, now, then I have the crazy bit that I throw in on top of it that I'm defending, where uh, even though they can function as props, as objects of thought and talk, they still don't exist. Hmm. And that's, that, that's the crazy bit, where it's, like, okay, yes, they're like prop, they're, they're props in games just like London, except, we, you know, and so we can, you know, we can imagine things of them, we can imagine of them that there's that, thus and so, we can refer to them, but I want to say, but they still don't exist. Uh, and so that's the, you know, so getting those two pieces together, the piece where uh, we have characters serving as props in, in these games of make-believe for, for the sequels. But the second part is, and at the same time, pulling it off while, you know, having them as objects of thought, imagination, and talk. We can talk about them. We can refer to them. You know, you're pulling it off despite the fact they don't exist. So the, those are the two sides of the project. Mm. Uh, uh, and both sides are controversial. <laughs> yeah, I would imagine. Well. Uh, so, but I'm having fun with it. I've got, I've, I'm, uh, I've got, a, I'm working on, I've got like drafts of four separate articles. One article has been published. One article uh, is, you know, I've just, you know, I received a revise and resubmit. I've resubmitted the revised version. We're mm-hmm. waiting to hear. It'll be another month or two. I'm optimistic that I've done the you, you know you know substantial enough revisions to make them happy. Uh, and I've got two, three or four other papers I'm working on. But I'm gonna 
uh, I'm finishing up something this week and next, and then I'm going to, I've been uh, uh, invited to submit a, 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 a book proposal for it. Uh, um, uh, uh, I talked earlier about when you, if you get a submission, you know, you get an invitation to publish something, it's always suspect. So I, I got this invitation from this, this person uh, and I went and checked her out and she's legit from uh, Lexington Books, uh, which is a, a series that's part of Rowan and, Roman and Littleford, Littlefield. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's actually, and, so, and I went to their web fight and found the person. So. Yes, you know it's a, a real person. Yes, it was a real person at a at a legitimate, you know. So I uh, I think they were. She said they were, in the the philosophy of art, they their cat their catalog was a little thin, and they mm. were. She was sort of slicing, uh, to call me to call me a big name in the field would be a much a, a wild stretch, but but little names in the field mm. uh, to, to do stuff. She actually asked she actually asked me if I would do, was going to do a paper on. Uh, the philosophy, uh, a book on the philosophy of music, which I was not going to do. And I said, well, but I am going to work on this. Uh, and uh, she's been in touch a couple of times over the last couple of years. Because I said, I'm going to do this, but not for a couple of years. Yes. Uh, so I'm optimistic that I will be able to get the book under contract before I write it, which would be nice. Yeah. Uh, which is, uh, you know, book publishing is very different from uh, article publishing. I was going to ask. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's... Uh, it's much more driven by the commercial side of things. Uh, where when, with the book that you were talking about, uh, when I tried to publish that, and I sent it out, and they, they said, you know, I, the response was, we're not even going to read this because books in this area haven't been selling. I mean, so they, they wouldn't even read it. Hmm. Uh, I mean, I've had I, you know, and of course, it's, it's not anonymous in the way that uh, journal publication is because if you're a big enough name they'll publish it uh they'll be more inclined to publish it because there's a better chance of, of getting people to read it uh uh when and, and the first one uh it was interesting i i, I published with uh mcgill queens a, 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 an okay canadian publisher i mean you know uh, but they seem like they're the only people who were interested in publishing books hmm. they're only book publishers interested in publishing books everyone else says we're, we don't want to even look at it. And then they say, oh, yeah, we're very enthusiastic. But that's because they will publish it only if you get uh, funding from the Canadian government. <laughs> yeah, 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 okay. Yeah. So, yeah. so there, there's that, you know, and so you had to, you know, as part of the process, you had to go through a referee process that determined whether, not, not just whether they thought it was a good book, but whether or not uh, it would get the kind of funding uh, that would enable McGill Queens to uh, publish it. That, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. What I'm, I'd imagine is it's tough too in uh, in areas like this with publishing, especially because books are like anything else, but they they go through um, uh, trends, right? Like for so yeah. long, it's been self help has just been what everybody's right. buying, right? And so then one thing takes over, and then yeah. yeah. But I mean, uh, for academic books, and of course exactly how this is changing hard to say but for academic books the main uh, purchasers are university libraries oh yeah okay so i mean my my, my book with uh the empty Re revelations i mean that's you know i i went and checked it's it's in a lot of university libraries mm. you know you can, you can do a search aha there it is i mean you know were there people you know individuals purchasing this book no uh uh, especially McGill Queens also sets the price really high because they can charge library. I think they they were selling like a hundred bucks to libraries. Oh wow! Per copy? Sorry. Per copy? Oh wow! Okay. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. And just because they know that the, li the university the libraries, libraries. Will pay it. yeah, no. that's really interesting. And then so are the libraries? Are the university libraries marking it up from there, or are they taking a loss? Well, the, the, the university libraries don't don't sell it. They just uh, oh, sorry, the library. I was thinking, yeah, sorry. I, you said you did say library. I heard bookstore. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, so they so they uh, they uh, you know you know, and then they just loan it out. Mm -hmm. But you know, uh, it's you know just uh, a matter of uh, you know you know uh, you know 
having a copy, and I am. And 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 uh, McGill Queens is is hooked into the library network, so I got you know, I think I I think I checked. I think it's in the Harvard University Library. Oh, okay. yeah. But of course, I, uh, but practically everything. Else. Yeah. <laughs> but but to have it listed there, you know, it's like wow, yes, my books at the Harvard University. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's but it is though, you know, like it is. It's one of those things where you can you can look at it either way and say like, well. It's no big deal. Or you could say, like, I'm a published author who has a book in the Harvard Library. That is, that's true. Yeah, it is true. Yeah. I mean, you know, if, if, if I'm out in a braggy mood. <laughs> yes, yeah. Well, yeah. That's, no, that's, I think that's really cool. That's got to, and this got to yeah. feel pretty cool to have that achievement. And then also be, to be asked to well, continue this, this, well, this, well, this one, I don't really know. You know, you know I mean, the, you know, the motivation of the Lexing person for contacting me in particular. I don't know how many people she contacted. Mm. Uh, and I mean, the, the one thing about book publishing is that Oxford, there's Oxford University Press and everybody else. Yeah, right. So they, they just dominate in philosophy. I mean, you know, uh, and so I think that background means that it's harder for these smaller publishers to get good monographs. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think that's part of the story. <clears throat> I mean, you know, you know, as I went and looked, they, they have, they have, they have, uh, you know, uh, some books in the philosophy of art, not, and not just a small number. They, they have, they have some in the philosophy of art and literature. So I mean, you know, they they, they have a little area there. Uh, so exactly, you know, how the the finances work for these people, I have no idea, and why this person thinks, you know, you know. Having someone like me writing a book in this area helps the publisher, given that the odds of them selling a lot of copies are low. I think it's you know you know you know you know sustaining an area as a possibility. I think it's more you, yeah. know, you know we need to have more publications here so people start continue to think of this as a place they can publish books in this area. Mm -hmm. I think that's there's probably some something of that about it. Yeah. Uh, but uh, you know because I'm you know, you know I'm a tiny little name. Uh, having me on your list is not gonna, you know, you know directly benefit the publisher. And, you mm. know, you know. Well, maybe they think so, right? If they've if they've reached out, then... yeah, well, maybe. But I mean, you know, but as I say, there's, there's there's so many unknowns. Yeah, yeah, you can't. I mean, and and know. but the the fact that she, you know she's followed up twice uh, means that that you know and and I discovered that she's a real person. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and 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 I told her. Don't follow up until this term, and I told her that a year ago, and mm. she did follow up this term. Yes, yeah, so she's so, actually paying attention. So, so she's paying attention. Yeah. So, uh, uh, you know, everything's slow. It'll be it'll be several years before because I, have, I've written a bunch of articles, but I haven't actually started the book. Yeah, uh, I mean, I I'm starting to see how the book goes, but there's no actual, there's nothing's been written that counts as part of the book. So when you go, when you undertake writing a book, is it something that like you can do your other work at the same time as, or is it just completely dominate all well, of your writing? I mean, it's, uh, I, and I can't speak for other people. I try and sort of, you know, in a way, double dipping is the wrong word, but I mean, to have, to have, be, be writing the book and articles on that material at the same time. So as I'm going through it, I mean, you know, if you're if you're talking about the other aspects of my job, the teaching and the administrative component, well, yeah, I mean, that's you know, trying to find time for your writing with those other is always a challenge. Uh, and this, you know, and this is, you know, you know, it's just it's not that you're you're doing less writing, you're just doing different writing while you're, you know, you know, you know, you know, you know fitting different writing into the uh into the the gaps and the other stuff so uh uh i mean and what i'm doing i, I uh, uh, the last time i wrote the, the book i mean the uh, the the textbook is a different thing but the last time i wrote the book i wrote the book first and extracted articles from the book this time i'm working the other way I'm writing the articles for first and turning the ideas and the articles into a book. Uh, so that's why I say, uh, uh, 
even though I haven't written a word of the book yet, I feel I've made good progress on the book because I've got this other stuff written that's going to be that I'm going to use to draw the ideas out. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm, that makes perfect sense, and I, I can I can actually relate to that a little bit too. I wouldn't call myself a writer by any means, but I do do writing in my own free time. Also, it's not related to work. I'm not in school, so it's just mm-hmm. stuff like that. And it's I won't generally start until I've thought about a topic for a a long long while and i've got my ideas thought out it's not like just out of nowhere i brute force my way into an essay and they're just essays that I right wrote, i understand but, yeah. i mean I, you know uh, i got a fight about this this kind of thing once yeah. <laughs> I, I think that writing can be part of the process of thinking oh, i completely agree with that yeah, yeah. And so, yeah yeah so i i got in this uh there was a what was your names there was this professor who yeah, and you can't do this anymore. But there was a, there was a time you could be a, once you got your job, you didn't really have to publish anything. Okay. You get you, once you got permanent, there was no, you know, and some people never did. Mm-hmm. And I mentioned that I thought you know philosophy occurred in the writing process, and this person who was had done any writing was quite insulted. <laughs> and I and of course, it's before I got here. I would because I was uh, for many years I was going back and forth between here and Lethbridge. And so I, I met the department before I before I came, and uh, I and of course I so I don't know the story of this guy. But he's all I all of a sudden I realize this guy's really angry at me. What have I said? Yeah. And you know, uh, I I am capable of the odd uh, uh, careless error in talking to people. So mm-hmm. uh, I wasn't surprised <laughs> that. Uh, but uh, you know, I, it was one of these I couldn't figure out what I, what I'd done. But it, but, but yeah, so. Yeah, no, I mean, and and I, and I think that you cannot work out a philosophical position until you've started writing it. So you you have to do enough thinking to get started, but as you're writing, the thinking will occur. Mm-hmm. So it's a, I mean, I I, I, I say this. It was a, there was a, I'm all over the map today, but that's sort of normal. I had a grad school classmate. Uh, he was actually a couple of years ahead of me, and and uh, he was this guy. He would. You know, he was there. You know, he was he was there, uh, working his dissertation. He'd leave, and go do something else. Come back again, and it turned out he'd never written a single word of his dissertation, because uh, he was writing on Plato, and he convinced himself that before he could start writing, he had to read everything that had ever been written about Plato. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Yeah, Inclu- including the, 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 the medieval commentary, you know, Islamic commentary. Wow, so everything. <laughs> everything. Yeah. And, of course, and of course, if you have that, you'll never, you'll never get anything done. Yeah. So, so I mean, the, the, you know, there's doing your background, but if you, you, you have to launch in at some point, and you have to work out your ideas as you go at some point. I mean, I, as I, when I say this, uh, I don't mean to overgeneralize. Different people write in different ways. Hmm. Uh, uh, <laughs> I'm I'm a one sentence at a time. First sentence, second sentence. I can't write the second sentence of a paper until I'm just, I'm satisfied with the first sentence. And you know, where some people think that's the craziest thing they've ever heard. Yeah, yeah. You've got to start working out the ideas in the middle and then filling out the you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, I even wrote my first book that way, where I you know. And so you literally wrote it, wrote it, start to finish. Start like, to finish. Wow. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, which is not how, well. I am going to write it this way. You know, the second book, this, the third book, this way. Uh, but I will have had, you know, I will have worked on the stuff in the middle before. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yes, uh, yeah. Yeah. But I, but I, you know, and uh, <clears throat> and of course, if you're writing a book that way, of course, you know, as you discover something down the road, you may have to go back and you know hold it. I'm going to have to start go back to the introduction again. <laughs> yeah. And how many times have I referenced that piece of information to right. going through? Yeah. Yeah. No, I completely agree with you. To to uh, just um, add to your thought about writing being an important way of thinking is just that it. At least for me, I, that's been my experience. I keep multiple journals, and like I said, I write an essay here and there, and it just it is feels like the most port- potent way for me to be able to formulate a cohesive thought on a subject that I want to understand better, just for the sake of knowing myself better, even. Right. So. So Nathan, I'm, I'm noticed we're over two hours. Yes, yeah. we, we may have to wrap this up soon. <laughs> no, that's we can we can do that here. So yeah, that's good. Well, I guess before I, I let you go, then can um, you just let people know where they can find your work or? Uh, 
There is a website, but it's not well maintained. I mean, you go, go to the my university profile site. Uh, so go to the philosophy department, okay. and then you can go to the university profile site, uh, which has a list of my, you know, uh, publications and uh, a link to my CV, but also a link to my poorly maintained website where there are, <laughs> where there there are some uh, uh, links to some versions, some of the articles for free, mm-hmm. uh, and you can even there are even links to some of the, some of the fiction I've been writing, although not uh, that's not very much up to date. Okay. Uh, yeah. No, that's that's perfect. And, and then I guess lastly, is there anything that you wanted to cover quickly that we didn't talk about? Or? No, I think okay. I think I think two hour two hours and twenty minutes in. I think yes. uh, you know, if if anyone sits through this whole thing, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yes. Well, yeah, we've covered a lot. So it was very nice to have you here. Thank you so much. Okay. Well, thank thanks for having me. Much appreciated.